approval of the agenda. Swearing in 
regards to the attorney and disclosure of things marked time communication. Thank you, Mayor. We have two quasi-judicial matters on the agenda today, both for second reading. One is half six, Stokes Road and Rezoning. The other is half seven, the Shanty Nicotan Rezoning. If you're here to speak on either of those matters, then our rules require that you stand at this time and be sworn in. See several, two, three. Are you swearing in, man? Raise your right hand. Anybody else? Okay, I see one there. A couple more. Oh well, why not? <laughs> this is—it's not to speak on any other matter. This is on the zoning matters, tab six and seven. If you want to speak on the shanty nicotine or the Stokes Road rezonings, you need to be sworn in. It's filed with the square for a testimony given this cause to approve the whole truth and nothing else to itself. Thank you very much. And you will, uh, uh, when you come to that podium, identify yourselves for the clerk. This is also the part of the meeting where we will um, have the members disclose any ex parte communications that they have had regarding any of these rezoning applications. Start where you want to start. Close it to you. No for Ms. Fisker? No. None for Mr. Boy, none for Amanda. Okay. I have been contacted by one person with a legal question in regards to um, tab six. Okay. Any, uh, any, any anybody else? Yes, that's it. All right, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to reading of all ordinances and resolutions into the record. Let's go back. Thank you, Mayor. I have one resolution and two ordinances at second reading to read as a record. Resolution 2019-06, a resolution of the City of Tiberias, Florida, amending the 2019 fiscal year adopted budget for the City of Tiberias, representing the First Amendment to the adopted budget, and providing for repealers, severability, and an effective date. Ordinance 2019-15, an ordinance of the City of Tiberias rezoning approximately 33.15 acres of property generally located west of David Walker Drive, south of Mary Road, from County Urban Residential R6 to City Residential Single Family RSF2. Subject to the rules, regulations, and obligations ordained by the City of Tiberias Council, providing for severability, providing for an effective date. An ordinance 2019-16, an ordinance of the City of Tiberias Rezoning approximately 20.71 acres of property generally located south of Slim Haywood Avenue, north of Camp Road, and west of State Road 19 from residential multifamily RMF3 to residential multifamily RMF2. Subject to the rules, regulations, and obligations ordained by the City of Area's Council, providing for severability, providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. Zobak. We want to consent agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on an item on the consent agenda? No. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. All right. We have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Four zero. Next, we have resolutions. Ordinances and public hearing. Nothing under first reading. Second reading, we do have uh, tab six, and that is ordinance 2019-15 Stokes Grove, the rezoning of 33.15 acres west of David Walker Road Drive, south of the Mary Road. And I did uh, receive a email question from a concerned uh, party. Uh, they wanted to make sure that this was properly noticed and posted. So I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Williams if you could answer that question. Well, I think when the, uh, I mean, I've given an opinion already that it was properly noticed, but I think as part of Mr. Fitzgerald's testimony, when he gives his staff report, he will testify and confirm the propriety of the notice. He's the one with the action. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll begin by saying that the, the notice was done properly. Uh, an advertisement was placed in the newspaper. Uh, signs were posted around the property noticing the public hearing and 
uh, mailers were sent to residents that were within 300 feet of the property. So we are in compliance with, with uh, notice requirements. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ordinance 2019-15 uh, considers uh, the rezoning of approximately 33.15 acres of property located west of David Walker Drive, South Mary <coughs> Road, and uh, fr from County Urban Residential R6 to City Residential RSF2. Uh, the property is currently owned by Stokes Groves of Eustis and contains one single family home and the majority being a uh, managed orange grove. On December 17, 2008, City Council approved the annexation of the property. And at the time of the annexation, the property owner elected to defer uh, applying for city zoning until such time that the property was considered for development. The applicant is requesting a rezoning from County Urban Residential R6, which under, under county code allows medium density single family housing. And they want to change it to city residential RSF2, which would also allow uh, medium density single family housing. The property is surrounded by a mixture of single family and multifamily residential. Uh, the applicant is requesting the, the rezoning with the intention of proposing at a future date a subdivision plat consisting of 121 single-family lots that would have a minimum width of 60 feet and a minimum, minimum square footage of 6,500 square feet. And preliminary and final plats uh, will come to City Council for approval. Uh, any development of the property will be in accordance with City uh, land development regulations. A traffic study was submitted to the City of Tavares indicating that surrounding roadways will operate at adequate level of service at the build out of the proposed development. The property owner has secured uh, school capacity reservation for 41 students. The environmental assessment indicates that there are no environmental concerns and the underlying future land use of a uh, mixed use neighborhood approved by Ordinance 2008-40 does not change and is compatible with the requested RSF2 zoning district. At their July 18th meeting, the Planning and Zoning Board voted unanimously to recommend approval of Ordinance 2019-15, and staff recommends that City Council move to approve Ordinance 2019-15, rezoning 33.15 acres from County Urban Residential to City Residential Single Family. Thank you. And I did not receive any request to speak forms on this item, so I'm assuming there's no one in the audience that would like to speak on this. <coughs> Council, do you have any questions? Comments? Yeah, I know we're working on a new comp plan and stuff, but I'm wondering about these. Does everything in this seem like it's going to fit in maybe with our future homes with some of the different things we've had talks on, such as? larger lots and different things, is this going to fit in or is this going to be another one of these that, uh-oh, we approve it now and then things change and we still have to honor it? I know I've been, we've all been attending the meetings. What's the next meeting? Tomorrow. The next meeting is tomorrow night, 5 to 7, yeah. in the <coughs> district center. I mean, the, uh, it's hard to uh, predict what the council will actually approve as a final comp plan and what the LDRs will approve <laughs> for that. I know they're allowed 50 feet wide lots. They're going to 60, so that's bigger. Uh, 60 feet wide. Just just for reference, across the street, across David Walker, is uh, Chelsea Oaks, and I believe those are 50 foot wide lots. So these will be so 10 feet wide. What I'm hearing from all the public meetings for all the stakeholders is go a little wider in the urban area and go a lot wider in the non urban area. This is the urban area, practically walking distance to downtown. And so you are, you know, when you're looking at um, compact housing, you should see it closer to your urban area, and then as you go further out, you're, you're looking at a larger lot. So I would say two positive things for this project is A, the lots are a little bit bigger than that are allowed, the lots are a little bit wider than what's around there, uh, and it's still compact, uh, which is what you typically see in a downtown area, so you'll have people coming and going, walking and biking near downtown. If it was out in a rural area of Tavares, uh, you, you might want to you know, look at maybe a little wider lots. Um, I think the comp plan will be done in about eight months, nine 
nine months. It'll, it'll and we'll have a really strong answers to your question. I don't see anything that's out of the, it certainly applies to the current comp plan. Uh, and I don't see anything way out of the sink with a future comp plan. You know, there's an YMCA close by that uh, supports this area, there's a downtown that supports this area. There's uh, the traffic study was completed. We then had our traffic engineer review the traffic study, and that they concluded the traffic, uh, our engineer concluded, that their engineer concluded that there was enough uh, road capacity. So um, I think that they, you know, the PNZ vetted it out, had a good discussion, and I don't think it's um, that inconsistent with the future comp plan. Uh, we don't know for sure until it comes before you, you have deliberation discussion. And, and and as far as our infrastructure, I know we've been caught sometimes where we do something, we add more, and then there's not as the water supply is not the pressure. I mean, is our infrastructure that we're not going to spend millions of dollars to fix an issue? Yeah, we just upgraded the water lines all down. Um, uh, David Walker upgraded the sewer lines. We looped it all so that we had adequate pressure uh, for the entire area. So I would say. If there's any area that's uh, uh, up to speed, uh, that would be that area. We do run into uh, problems once in a while when, when we have elevations. We had that over in Royal Harbor. We had to have an extra booster pump for that area. Um, and uh, we, we took care of that. This area is not elevated. It's got all new water lines and sewer lines. I think we're pretty good to go there. Any other questions? Just to be clear, we're not, I know that there's a concept plan with their community plan of 60 B water, but the rezoning doesn't bind them to that, correct? That's correct. This is a conceptual plan based on the, the plat that we're reviewing, but the, uh, the conceptual plan is not tied to the zoning in the same way it would be for a plan development ordinance. But the plat will come back. The plat will come back. And that will have 60 foot wide lots. Absolutely. And it'll come to the council. And if it doesn't, well, that would be an issue. And that could come before eight months to when our comp plan is done, correct? More than likely it would be in case we put some restrictions. Okay. Because the, the preliminary plan will probably come before the end of the year. Okay. Any other questions? south of Slim Haywood Avenue, north of Camp Road, and west of State Road 19. The property is owned by Shanty McCaden uh, and, is vacant, and is a vacant portion of the existing Shanty McCaden project that is currently undergoing development. The applicant is proposing to rezone the property for, uh, from residential multifamily RMF3 to residential multifamily RMF2 which is a less intensive zoning that allows the construction of single-family homes, duplexes, and townhomes. Shanty Nakaden has primarily been developed in previous phases as an age-restricted, multifamily condominium community, but the property owner has expressed an interest in providing single-family housing as an option to uh, potential buyers. The property is surrounded by a mixture of multifamily and single-family property, uh, any development will be in accordance with city land development regulations and the underlying future land use of moderate density approved by ordinance 2015-02 does not change and is uh, compatible with the requested RMF2 zone. <coughs> At their July 18th meeting, the Planning and Zoning Board voted unanimously to recommend approval of ordinance 2019-16 and staff recommends that City Council moves to approve Ordinance 2019-16 rezoning 20.71 acres from uh, residential multifamily RM of three to residential multifamily RM of two. All right, thank you. And we do have a request to speak. 
speak uh, for what Mr. Kerr did. This is my racial group. <coughs> just ask that you, uh, Chair, to limit your comments to three minutes. And if you have any questions, just ask those and then we can uh, try to address those with your finish. Um, Thank you. All right. <coughs> I'm basically here on behalf of our HOA president. She was unable to attend. And it sounds like you guys are for rezoning RMF3, RMF2, and we are as well. I'm representing the Foxborough subdivision on her behalf while she's coming. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And again, just for clarification, that was what you were going from. They're requesting to go from an RMF3 down to an RMF. This is what's considered a down zone. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Council, do you have any questions? Or, excuse me, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak to this before I close public comment? Yes. Just state your name and address for the clerk. Chuck Hyatt, 902 North Sinclair Avenue, Tavares, Booth Armstrong Hyatt. I concur with zoning and staff and so forth, and if you guys have any questions, we have to answer. All right, thank you. Council, do you have any questions? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Right. Now we're going to move on to federal government. I believe we have a number of people here that would like to speak on uh, tab 12. So yeah. It's okay, the council would like to maybe go ahead and I don't think so. I think there's no objection. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and uh, move to tab 12. Right now, so let me just move on to All right. This is the concept for primitive camping. And I would turn this over to. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. And a big thank you to all of you. I've worked in government for 30 years, and you understand the process. You came out of your homes, you came to this meeting. Thank you. It means a lot. This says a lot about you. So this is how we get to develop wonderful projects. It's through the uh, public input. So I appreciate your presence. Um, I do want to say that we were asked to conduct a research project, and this is precisely what this is. It is research, it is not implementation. Big difference. So uh, we are happy to deliver the findings from our research. Uh, I have a gentleman here tonight, he is hiding. Scott, oh, no he isn't. There he is. <laughs> uh, Scott Aldridge is the community services uh, manager and he is here to deliver uh, his report to city council. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, good afternoon. Earlier this year, we were asking to do some research on what it means to do a primitive campsite at the Tiberius Nature Park. And over the past few months, we've, we've dived into it. We learned a lot, and we're happy to kind of give back some of the report that we found over the past few months. First thing we really wanted to do was look at the, look at the site, look at what the site was. We required the land from the Florida Communities Trust grant. And they have restrictions, so could we even do something like that? We reached out to them. Turns out that that is allowable. We have a management plan that we can update from time to time, but that is one of the allowable uh, amenities that we could do to the park. Next thing we really wanted to do was find out what else is around this area as far as primitive camping is concerned. Uh, reached out to several different places, the State Parks Association of Florida, Lake County, found that the closest one was really Lake Louisa State Park, and then a few in uh, Wakaiva Springs, out in Sorrento, and Rock Springs as well. And talked with them, learned about what they have, what they implemented, how they implemented it, and what problems and things that they have coming through. We also wanted to look at really what we needed to do with the land in order to bring in a, camp a campsite like that, a primitive and it consists of clearing a little small piece of land, um, putting in some little small fire rings, a picnic table if you're, if you're uh, wanting to do that, 
and regular maintenance as far as upkeep. It, it takes uh, law enforcement policing it. It takes trash pickup on an annual, regular basis. So those were some of the things that we looked at and, and estimated that it would cost around $4,500. That's what the signage that we would need to have on there um, is great, as well as some of the, the uh, bear boxes. You don't want to have bears coming into your food and things like that. So these boxes cost money. In speaking with the, uh, the people from the State Parks Association, I learned some issues that they wanted. I asked them specifically, what are your issues? What are your biggest concerns when you have a primitive campsite? And they were, they were kind of in a different boat than we were where they, they monitor theirs. They have a, it's a state park, so they have a park ranger that's there. They charge their uh, public for campsites each night. And so they were a little bit different in that aspect, but the biggest thing that I found was is trash. That's that's their concern. Is trash that gets left behind. They do a constant management of trash pickup. They also uh, pointed to the fact that people come in and they cut the trees down. They cut down little brush trees that are living in order to make firewood and things. So that was some of their biggest issues. Uh, bears were another one. They really cautioned us in this area about bears. Hence the uh, box that I was talking about with the for the safe food. And then. One of the, um, the, the, the lady from Lake Louisa actually had just moved from Lake Griffin, which is in Leesburg. And I talked to her for a good long time, and she said she moved from Lake Griffin. They were actually considering uh, primitive camping in Lake Griffin, decided against it because of the homelessness. And so that was one of the aspects that they chose to, to avoid in there. But otherwise, they didn't have any trouble with those um, pieces. So... Presenting that, just to let you know, those are what we've found. Um, we're here to answer any questions that you might have. And again, we look forward to what you talk about. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so right now, I'm going to open it up for public comment. And like I said, um, we do have some requests to speak forms up here. We want to hear from all of you. But we do, uh, if, if you're going to get up and Say basically the same thing that the person in front of you said. If you want to get up and just say, I agree with everything they said, you can do that. And just uh, ask that you try to please keep your comments to three minutes or less. So uh, do you have our request to speak forms? Do we have to? Because we did have um, <coughs> one gentleman that I think you wanted to. Left out of it from the city. We don't have our dock, we don't have our walk, our trails. 
it's, it's not maintained, the garbage. We don't even have tops on our garbage cans that are out there right now. So by the time you go out there, this, this park right now, with police intervention, is used nothing more than for drugs and sex. And the people that want to go out there at that time frame go out in the early morning and all the troubles start in the evening. We have drag racing going down the streets. We have so many bad things that are happening in this park right now. And the police have records of all the events that have, that have translated through that area. So we would like for you to take the opportunity to clean the park up with the allocations and the funds you have right now. Put bear-proof garbage cans out there so it doesn't take three hours to clean it up once everything's out in the sun. And get rid of the drug paraphernalia and everything else that's been, that's been found in that area. But more importantly, um, you're talking about fires and fire pits. The situation that we have out there, any open fire that contains in, in a wetlands community, we have a housing development that's right next door. It's modular homes. We can't have open fires anywhere near a modular home. One spark, one spark ignites, and we lose our whole entire community. That's your taxpayer base, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you're, you want a primitive camping for, for your taxpayer base right here. And we're a little bit perplexed as to why it was even considered because of its closeness to, to a community. I mean, I can understand. You have to take a look at your park that you had that you cleared 11 acres of out of your dog park. And it came, it came to fruition on that, that you just cleared 11 acres out there and found how many permanent homeless structures on that property. Imagine what happens in 110 acres when it's not monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's not a traffic study that can ever be done that can, that can encompass that amount of criteria that we go in that we go into play. The city doesn't have the capital or the resources or, or the events to monitor that park 24 hours a day to keep the homeless and the people out. The police don't have the budgetary needs nor the four-wheel drive capabilities of getting in there. They have enough to do. Um, I completely understand that this is something that needs to be done, but let's just find a better place for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Melody Lowe Lewis. Melody Lewis. Oh, oh hi. Um, I don't normally do this, and I'm not even programmed to be here, okay? My name is Melody Lewis. I'm a woman of God, and I've personally lived with homeless in this area. I've been a part of the Rainbow Family Gathering for the last 25 years. My church is Logos Fellowship for 18 years, and they found me out there. There's three sides to every story, and this one's anarchy, the third side. What I have to tell you is fact. What we have here is a meth epidemic right here in Lake County. Why this personally hasn't been brought directly to the president is beyond me. The jails here will prove my words. Lacey, who is in a, Bell a Bellevue local, about 20 minutes from the forest, was killed just because she said she would turn people in that she was friends with because they stole from her. Don't warn anyone that you'll call the cops, just do it. It's kind of a life death statement right now. Since 2011, no body's been found. Rainbow had a gathering last year in February where a brother came up missing. Info on him came in to me last night in this meeting came up before I could go to the proper authorities. You see, I mention this because your homeless isn't just people who have lost their homes. Some have been primed and taught how to live in society in ways that still keep their quality of life. They do not care about you or your family, and a lot of them hate you because you live in homes and they don't. They feel it's unfair and live communally as a, to present a positive atmosphere when it's in fact riddled with drugs, trafficking women, and dirty deeds. Personally, I've cleaned up five meth kitchens in the forest with law enforcement officers 20 minutes away from here at Lake Mary. If there's camping and it's primitive and it's 20 minutes away, then why can't they just go there? There's a joint force in Rainbow based out of Tennessee and Texas where all the chop shops are and stolen vehicles go. People who don't have social security numbers that go to Rainbow Land that are implemented to come and deal with your family at your house and burn it down, and then you're one of them. You will know then what it's like not to have what you need or have to depend on someone else. That's the key. This is not for this tiny town's community. It will be detrimental if you allow this, especially unsupervised great Rainbow, Rainbow Land to happen. The jail cannot hold what you move into this land if it is open. Marion County has rumors about how messed up their judges are and how not to mess up there. But Lake County, the word on the street is this is Camp Snoopy, okay? No one's afraid of the jail here or the cops for that matter. Bet that. This means putting everyone in danger. Your cops, your first responders, and your citizens. Then, realize this is a camp full of people set out to be a 
part not to be a part of society. You have to cater this. Your city will really, bad things will happen. Uh, Rainbow from Al Ocala started a meth epidemic 15 years ago in Leesburg at the Picciola camp. I know him. Right now in Basketball Park, on 473, there's a man peddling meth on a red bike. He's all out there, 473, 441, frequents the Shell Station in the BK. I knew him when I was 25, and I was out there. He's a bad man, has kids and an ex-wife that won't claim him. <sighs> Just camps in the woods, Basketball, um, camps in the woods, in the basketball park area, cooking the mess. And they can make this mess in a cooler now with three ingredients. This is the type of person that builds an interest in homeless people, feeding on them, turning them into junkies, and eventually opening their friends' home to them. And as an example, the sub shop right on 473, the man died. He took control of the house until the cops threw him out, and he's able to try to contract the house in some tax manner. I have their programming, and I've been raised to fight against this right here your society, your go to work, your do this, your do that. I've been programmed to eat out of a dumpster and to live life, okay? But 14 years ago, I turned myself into a glass blower, and I'm still struggling, but I'm still doing what I can to be a person and be a society. That is not what these people are doing. I've personally dealt with rapes, molestations. Ms. Lewis, I appreciate you, but your time I, I'm literally, I'm, my advice is no. The winter will attract more homeless from other states. Just know that. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. Derek Treadwell. site for the and where the nature park exists. I've owned property there for 11 years. It was my primary residence until 2015, and I moved to Royal Harbor. So I'm very familiar with the area, and I remember when that nature park was nothing but a bunch of Florida scrub with a path, a, a footpath that walked through, and there was a dock at the end, and many people took advantage of that dock to fish. Then the Boy Scouts came in and cleaned it up, and then the city took it and then the city made it a nice park. It's a beautiful nature park. There are people in the community who like to go for a walk through that park and enjoy the nature. I am very concerned, while I don't mind camping per se, I am very concerned about a primitive camp site, uh, as the way it was proposed to me, where, as the young lady who just spoke said, you're inviting a group of people into that community where they are 55 plus uh, majority residents, many of whom are widows, many of whom are um, northerners who come down or snowbirds. So a lot of the properties are vacant six months of the year. I think you're going to open up a door for increased van vandalism, uh, lack of safety, and then increase in wild animals. We have in Royal Harbor, we have a growing uh, band of coyotes coming in, and I can see the coyote population multiplying, the bear mop population <coughs> multiplying, and nobody has mentioned snakes and alligators. There is no seawall. So the alligator, and the water level right now is right up to ground level. The alligators come right across and sun themselves in the yards. It won't be long before they find out that there are people back there with food. So those are my major concerns. I don't think it's the right place. I don't even know why it was proposed so close to a community. And it's a nature park, for Pete's sake. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Applauding. We've got a lot to get through here. We've got uh, John Arganoli. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, the people who preceded me did a good job of covering all the negatives. Uh, I, again, want to know why somebody even thought we should make a primitive campground there. Uh, there's no positives to having one there. If you want to go primitive camping, 
The Ocala National Forest had multiple sites in the Ocala National Forest. As people have brought up, Lake Louisa has uh, sites available. So we, it's not a shortage of primitive sites that's a problem. It's, it's not a problem. The major problem is the homeless. Uh, we see them every day. We pass them on the road. We see them standing on the edge of wooded areas, begging for money, begging for cigarettes, begging for food. But when you offer them food, they don't want the food, they want the money. Uh, it's a bad idea. It'll never work. I brought something to read, but it's, it's been all been covered. Uh, and it would really be the smart thing to go no on this, because you're going to have a lot of people saying, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Jerica? Jerica, thank you. Jerica, yes, sir. Yeah, Jonathan Jerica. Um, I live at 1620 Sunshine Lane right down the road. I can actually see the entrance to this nature park from our driveway. My wife and I and our one year old son just moved here to Lake County to Tavares uh, six months ago, seven months ago, down south. Love it. We, uh, we were attracted to the area for a lot of reasons. It's just not in line with who we are. And her grandparents lived here right in that neighborhood. So we said, you know what, let's go try it. And packed up our lives and we came here. Part of the reasons we left where we were is a lot of homeless problems. And it's not the homeless people, but the people that like to parse words and talk about swimming. It's not about the people. It's about the byproduct. The byproduct of the trash, the byproduct of the drugs, the byproduct of the prostitution. We're, at, we're, see, we're actually seeing in this neighborhood right now, and I don't, it's not due to the nature park, it's probably half due to the bathrooms that are put there and open to the public, and the squatters that live down the road, but that's another story. Um, we watch them come off the tracks, we watch them march in, we watch them hang their clothes, we find the paraphernalia, and all of a sudden, I'm, Taking my one-year-old kid on a walk to go through that, yeah, it just doesn't feel right. So the first thing my wife and I said was, oh, we got to move again? Where are we going to move to? I'd like to give it some time. I'm not going to move right now because I understand it's a study, not an implementation. I heard the words loud and clear. I appreciate that as well. I just hope the city's not trying to you know, do the one end around. I couldn't help but to notice a lot of homeless people were just kicked out of where they were on David Walker and Mount Homer drive by that every day to go to work. So I'm thinking in my mind, is there coincidence? Because there's never real coincidences. So I hope, I hope that it's not an end or not. And I would also propose if it's only $4,500 to make this thing happen, you should factor in maybe a waiver for everyone in the neighborhood's property taxes until the experiment's over. That would be a starting point. Just a starting point. Because that doesn't even account for, like you said, homes that are vacant for six plus months of the year, the money that people put into their homes, the cars, the boats, I'm one of them. So I'd ask that it was a no. Keep it as it is. Beautiful. Attractive for everyone to come and visit Lake County and to move here. We love it. I just opened up shop. I plan on staying for a while. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sharon Ness. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. A lot of what I was going to say has been covered, so I will skip that part of it and kind of bounce around here. Uh, I live on Sunshine Lane, 1610. So I'm sort of at the end of a little road that goes around there. <coughs> I think a primitive part for the campground could be a positive thing if it's handled correctly. If we have the rangers that are there uh, many hours out of the day, if there's a nominal fee, if they have to register ahead of time, if they present ID so we know who's in there, if there's limits on how long the campers stay, handle it like the state and county parks in Europe. That's all that it would be helpful for. The rest of the thing is the access road for fire. And I'm I'm sorry, I'm running out. But yes, access for EMS and fire into the park, not just to the front door. Thank you very much. Next we have Diane Eaton. Thank you. My name is Diana Eaton. I live at 714 North St. Clair Edwards Avenue in Tavares. Um, 
I'm against this idea, but I understand a lot of people are wanting to know where this idea came from. It looks like you, Mr. Stevenson, uh, Stevenson uh, considered a desire for this. Um, do you primitive camp yourself? We'll answer questions after. Okay. Time. <laughs> anyway, I see the cost of being $4,500, and we all know I want my back alleyways done, and we're getting it done, and I know. But I just feel like there should be, the funds could be used elsewhere within the city to promote um, eco tourism. Um, and speaking for the Hamels, they wanted to share, um, they own two five-acre parcels that butt up against that nature park, and then including the 1,400 acres that butt up against those five acres, with um, the homeless coming in, which has been stated, and the campfires. <coughs> it's just a very much concern that that is going to be um, coming over to their parcels, um, parcels of land. Um, people walking through, it's a nature park, why, why, why not turn it into, I mean, it's a nature park, what about a butterfly garden? I mean, there's other ways of promoting an area than a campground. Um, people mentioned uh, the dock. A lot of people have covered areas that are on and they bring them with. We don't want this. As a matter of fact, coming, we talk about homeless in this area. Coming to the meeting, I stopped in at the house, and I've got someone crossing over using a Winn-Dixie grocery cart with all their things in there. And he mentioned he doesn't have a place to stay, and they're going towards downtown Blue Park. I don't know what the you know, downtown how much it holds in homeless, but I just don't think that this is going to be a very good idea. And I would encourage you guys to, to vote against this. Program of the campground, and I'm speaking on behalf of my neighbors also. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Teresa Storms. I live at 12740Lit Circle. I just wanted to let you know I found out through Facebook this morning, through word of mouth, that this meeting was going on. Didn't get any notification in the mail or anything about any of this. So I wanted to let you know, it's not Thompson Estates where this nature park is at. It's the wrong area. It's in Wisconsin Michigan Shores. So that's all wrong. Another thing, I think that we need to be notified all of the residents and homeowners by mail that you guys are having these meetings so that we all know when we can come and attend and voice our concerns. One of my major concerns is that if you agree to this, our property values are going to go down, our crime rate is going to go up, we're going to have increased traffic in our area, we don't have any fire protection out there. These people are out there starting fires. We don't have any fire hydrants or anything. And it's one way in and one way out. So I do not agree. Thank you very much.
Tavares area, which is that whole peninsula down there on the end. And then the other part is County. And the original plan, because I came in here yesterday and I looked at that, it said that uh, there are supposed to be two entrances and that the primary entrance was supposed to be over here off of 561. Now, uh, we just heard uh, Diane talk about uh, the, uh, the ranch that's over here. I went over to this other end looking to see if there was an entrance. And if you come down here onto a road right there, uh, actually it's right there, and then, then you drive up a dirt road up here, there actually is an opening there. I wish I could and I ran into a guy in a golf cart that lives there, and he created it so he could drive his golf cart in and come in from the other side. But there is a road there. You could create an entrance that isn't going to affect anywhere near as many residents. It's closer to 561. But it's on the other side, which is on the lower side of that parkway. Uh, so I'd like to point out that uh, somewhere along the line, somebody didn't implement the plan the way it was originally predicted. I haven't had a chance to go through all the change documents, um, but if this proceeds further, I will. And I'm going to use the microphone. Uh, down there is the uh, other entrance that you can get in, folks. So. And so, uh, what I would recommend if you go to the next slide, please, there's only about six slides here is that just shows the entrance to the park. Uh, they did have a great sign in there, and actually it's pretty nice. The plan said it was to be paved, eight foot wide paved path all the way around there with a white stripe in the middle. And that was never done either. So if you walk, you can't drive a bicycle through there because it's too sandy. Uh, so that was one of the plans. That's supposed to be for bicycles, but it's very hard to use bicycles there. Uh, so the plan was not followed on putting in the pavement. Um, the, uh, I just show these pictures here because the, the neighborhood is already aggravated because potholes aren't fixed. They've called and I've talked to neighbors down there. Because I live in the county, they come out and they fix them. But to vary some reason doesn't come and fix those. So even though you have the whole mowing crew out there just today cleaning up the, that site. Um, but those are some pictures that, can you slow down please, don't look forward. Three minutes, man. All right. And the, uh, but that's an abandoned home there that has not been handled either. Okay, you can go to the next one. And so here's the reasons to deny the camping. A number of them have already been mentioned. Uh, the, uh, they, the residents are already angry. State parks have forest rangers in this plan for $4,000. You don't have any funding. You need to have somebody monitoring that, and then it might be acceptable. Uh, the neighbor on the south side said so there's a terrible homeless problem in the park already about three years ago, and he said it was cleaned up. Um, the original plan said there was two access points. That isn't true. It didn't happen. Um, they've already talked about it being turned down by another park. Uh, they, and some of these others have be, already been repeated. Uh, and the pier hasn't been replaced yet. Uh, so you haven't even fixed uh, the pier. And I would suggest you spend that $4,000 repairing the pier. Next slide, please. And so an alternate solution, I think, is, I mean, because it would be kind of nice if I was a camper place to stay, but the entrance should be moved, like the original plan, to the 561 side. And uh, that uh, you need to have somebody to monitor at all times. Uh, a gorilla out of the box thinking would be to hire maybe the guy that I met with a golf cart. He's right down there by the entrance. And have him, you know, handle the IDs and everything else. And uh, let's see, the, the, um, allow, only allow a mission and then pave that trail in there. And we'll go what next slide. We've got it, man. Thank you very much. Oh, he's afraid to show the next slide. Go ahead and show the next slide. Just real fast. And that's going to be it. Next real fast. If you don't mind, I'll offer my time. No, we're not, we're not doing that. Why not? See, this is, remember, elections are coming up.
things and further diamonds, you know, last night. So, so if you want to speak, we're more than happy to hear from everybody that's here. Um, we'll just remind you that we are really allowed for three minutes. So, thank you. I'm Robert Kuhn. I live at 1700 Sunshine Lane. <clears throat> I represent 18 homeowners in the area. We want to propose your training and camping. Uh, we yield our time to uh, land advance today. The, and 90% of our concerns have already been covered by other speakers. Uh, bottom line is, the 18 homeowners in that area do not want this to be passed. And it's 18 homeowners. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. So if you would just uh, state your name and address for the my name is Jim Jackson. I'm at 1760 Sunshine Lane. Uh, we hate to take y'all's time up like this, uh, but it, I mean, there's nobody for this. We've even called the people up north. They're not for this. I had a long conversation yesterday with Mr. Stevenson. I explained so many of the, why we don't want it. And I want to bring up, I know some of this has already been mentioned, but the dock, do you know the dock is falling apart? It has been for years. Do you know people are still going out on the dock fishing? There's one, two before, going across an entrance of it. There's a section missing but people are still going out there. Also, this dock is falling apart. We have boaters and skiers out in the lake. What are we, are we going to wait till somebody gets hurt? And we're worrying about primitive camping? I, I'm just, we're, we're, we're missing the whole point. We got garbage cans out there that have no lids. The bears go in, they tear it up, and it takes three days to a week, I was telling Mr. Stevenson, for them to go out there and clean the crap up. There's condoms, there's tampons, that if you go in the back, there's little baggies where, not marijuana, but either uh, crystal meth or cocaine's used in these bags. Nothing's, and since we have the light, Mr. Drury knows about the lights. He helped us get them out there. And that was, a, that was one of the greatest things that's happened out there. Because cars now pull up, they see that we can see. I live directly across the street. I can tell you, me and my wife can tell you everything that happens. And we see six, eight, ten teenagers pull up. They get out of the cars because of the lights. They go to the back. The other thing, we have several people in the neighborhood that has breathing problems. We don't need no fires over there. We don't. I mean, we're going to ask you, and we could save everybody a lot of time. Oh, I want to say one more thing. Somebody, he mentioned the alligators. Yes. I live right across the street. A few weeks back, two, one was approximately six foot, the other one approximately maybe eight foot, laying right in the parking lot of the entrance to the park. One was holding a coon in its mouth. We don't need, right now is mating season. These gators, you can stand in my yard and hear them. They go all the way up in this park. They come all the way up in our yard. It's, this, is, this is not a joke. If somebody, excuse me, I'm sorry. No, we understand. But I think you made it home. We really appreciate those. And if, if we could just, if somebody would have come out and just said, hey, we could explain this and save everybody. Thank you. Clifford Smith, 
the letter 30122 Green Bay Drive. I also own another home across the street. I own two of them over there. I went down that park this morning. And you can't go in there unless you wear rubber boots. And you shouldn't go in there unless you carry a gun. Okay? Sharon was driving down, coming home two months ago. We then ran over a bear. So they're in there. That shouldn't be turned into it, but it should be cleaned up. You're going to have to put roads or something in there because you can't walk in it. It's a swamp. If it rains every day, it's going to stay a swamp. So you've got to deal with snakes and everything else in there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did the other shirt come forward? Just um, please stay for the My name is Mike Cutler. I live at Trees in Reserve, <clears throat> 2 8 Pasaki. And I'm going to go out on the limb here. And I'd like a show of hands on everybody that's in opposition or opposes this proposal. I think that will answer a lot of your questions in the future. I would like to see you take this off of your agenda. I would like for you to discontinue any further discussions. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, you go ahead. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to speak. Please, if you don't mind, I mean, please be respectful. Please, no applause. We understand you agree with, uh, with everything that's being said. Believe me, I understand. We're going through this. But thank you very much for being respectful. Yes, sir. James. Berkeley, one, one, two, six, five, three, split, door, circle. Uh, I understand that put facilities uh, on the front of the park for the people to clean and go to the bathroom. If, if you think the people who come to the, the, this place are, are, are and stretch themselves out are, are, are going to walk a uh, uh, hundred and one acres across to, to use the bathroom and then clean themselves up. Pardon my French, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention, yes, it, we, we all already know it's going to be nothing but drug addicts. The trash, they're not going to use the trash and, and, and they're certainly not going to clean up after themselves. So, we all already seen the pictures of how these people live and the campsites that they're going to create. Sorry, there's people living in there now. And that's the truth. At least there, there are few and far and in between there. As, as the previous per person mentioned when they cleared out uh, another forest, how, how many homeless they had found in there. They're at least the, 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 they're in there now, but they're in there illegally. Not not you're trying to make it legal, so 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 that they can flood the place. At least the ones that are in there are are, are being discreet. They're, they're not creating gigantic fires, and and and, and they're hiding. You're trying to make what they're doing legal, and, and the people that want and do come to the park now don't see the people that are in there. They're in the far front. They're in a forested area that, that you can't get to off the trails. So they, they don't see the people that are in there at this moment. When you do this, they're going to feel freedom throughout the park, and, and those are, are going to be the only people that are in the camp sites that you make. And then all of the people here that do go there and walk their dogs and everything will, will no longer, uh, not only these, all of the other people that come will no longer be able to, to go and enjoy that beautiful park. Not only the, the people, it's a, a nature park. The people are talking about the bears. We love the bears that are in that park. I, I hear them every single night calling 
to each other. Their moans and their groans are beautiful. I hear their babies. When I hear their babies, it's absolutely wonderful. The birds out there are, are almost as, as tall as me. That is such a, it's a, a nature. The nature in that park is wonderful. It, 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 it's not going to be there once you do this. The, it, it, that we, it, you know, it, it, to various nature park, you can call it, to, you change the name to Garbage Park. Okay, please, don't do this to the nature that's in there. And, and don't do this to the people that are here and enjoy that park now, because you'll be making a great mistake. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this matter? Yes, ma'am. If you'll just uh, state your name and address the department, please. Hi, I'm Deborah Gerwig. I live at 1727 Sunrise Court. I'm a single person, and I left work early just so that you can hear my voice. Do not do this. This is not a place for it. I oppose. Thank you. I'm concerned because I recently moved here from Ohio. My son and my daughter, they're going to be walking to the bus stop. They're 16 and 14. And I do not trust that you're going to have all these people freely roaming the streets. You're not monitoring them. You're not going to know if they're, they're you know, the pedophiles. You're not going to know anything about these people. And you're going to, my daughter, she wanted Miss Columbus. She's gorgeous. And these guys are going to watch her walk by. And they're going to, you know, you're just going to have so many different kind of pedophiles, drug, drug abusers. I'm a nurse. And I know exactly what goes on. And you're going to allow this. I'm so nervous. I'm not a good speaker for the people. But my son and my daughter, I do worry that they're going to walk to the bus stop. They're going to walk past these people every day. And I have to worry that they're going to, you know, they're pedophiles. They're pedophiles or drug abusers. I mean, there's, there's paraphernalia everywhere. And I'm familiar with it because we, we do the Narcan, we do all that stuff. And so I just don't feel like they should, should be subject to something that, you know, there's nature reserve and you said you did your research, but how much research did you do? Are you going to be monitoring the pedophiles or are you going to be monitoring? Yes, ma'am. You can just address the council. Okay, but I, I am concerned because you have all the pedophiles, you have, there's just so much to be concerned about that. I'm sure, are you going, is there going to be someone out there monitoring these people at all times? Is there going to be a privacy fence where my daughter, she walks by, she's going to be fine. That we don't have to worry about that. I mean, there's just so many reasons, and there's so many young families moving in. There's a lady that just had twins. Her little children are going to be walking to the school bus as well. But then you're going to have all these people that nobody knows anything about, and the majority of them are pedophiles, the majority of them are drug abusers because they're not working. They're living on the streets. They're going to, I mean, they're scavenging, you know, they're scavenging through everything for food. Where are they getting the food? They're going to be going through our trash, everybody else's trash. And honestly, my son was doing research today at Tiberius High School. And if those people are freely walking down a dead end street, these residents have right to take action because there's no reason for those people to be walking down the street. None. So if they're out running about the neighborhood, who's, who's going to protect us? I'm afraid to stay by myself. You know, I'm here with my two children. I'm afraid to stay by myself, let alone because I mean, there are some people back there. That, Honestly, it scared the life out of me because I see them walking up and down the street, and you know they're homeless. And I just, I cannot see my son and daughter just walking and running into different things on the street. And I, like these have condoms and tampons and just disgusting things that, and why, why isn't this place being monitored as it is now? I mean, you have trash cans where they're overfilling, you have bear, you have snakes. My mother and I were walking the other day, we heard monkeys in the trees, and we're like, uh -huh. So it's, it's really crazy what's going on back here, and it's not being taken care of. We went out of the dock to go fishing with our son, and the dock is going to fall over. The dock is literally, there's a handrail, and it's falling over. The dog is terrible, and we... So, I mean, there's just certain things, and you're, you're trying to make this a nature reserve, and there's, like my father and stepfather said, there's all this land, and you want to put it where the elderly people? But, okay, that's fine. But there's all this land that you want to put that these people have lived here all their life, and they come here to retire. They're running out of time. I'm sorry. You guys are running out of time. I'm getting older. They need a place to just kind of rest with you. Quick. Understand your concerns, family. Please. Why do you all put 
good in the facilities over there if you are planning on doing this in the long run. Thank you. Do you have a seat, please? Is there anyone else that has not spoken that would like to speak? Yes, ma'am. Your name My name is Debbie Cooney, and I live at 1700 Sunshine Way. And talking about the facility, you know, they put in this nice facility that none of us even was aware of this. And the thing was, when we started questioning, it was to be locked in the evenings, open back up in the mornings. That hasn't been happening. It doesn't get clean daily like it's supposed to be either. The trash cans don't get empty daily either. And you know, you guys are talking about camping back in there and stuff. Y'all know that this is a lot of wetlands back in there? It's all squishy as it is now. It's never dry. And what about the animals? It's not just the people. What about the animals who are running out? That is their habitat. So, you know, I don't understand you guys' concept for even giving us any consideration with all the homes around this area. And like somebody even mentioned too, you don't know about these different people that have breathing problems. We get 20, 25 sites in there. They're all building fires at night. We're all going to be breathing this. It's a close, close community <coughs> out there. We don't need it. There are signs that says, don't pick the berries, don't cut the firewood, don't pull the plants. What do you think is going to happen to our nature park? It's going to be destroyed. You guys are so concerned about everything. Why isn't that dock fixed? People's griped and griped and griped. You're going to wait till somebody gets hurt? And then fix it? You know, I just don't understand what you guys even think. You know, even the places where the cars park, it's not even paid. Our car the other day got stuck, we had to push the thing out. I mean, I don't understand why you even want to consider putting in a camping site right there, right on a railroad, and you cross the road into more homes. It makes no sense, none whatsoever. Yes. Thank you. I was excited because there wasn't one before and I had to get my 
to start drive to go to the bathroom, it's much more convenient now. It is unfortunate that people are abusing the bathrooms. However, we're going to, I'm sure everyone's going to step their game up to make sure that that's not happening. I do understand that there's a drug problem and a homeless problem because I work at the public defender's office. I know better than probably most people. And it's not just in your neighborhood, that part of the it's, it's everywhere. Mark and I live in the same neighborhood, and we've got squatters in our neighborhood. It doesn't matter where you live, it just stinks. Um, I know that we've been working on the docks. We want to make it wheelchair accessible as well so that everybody can use it. And then we can get it paved all the way to the dock so that everybody can get from the street to the dock, which is why we're looking for grants. I don't believe we get it, so it makes it a lot faster and easier for everybody. Um, as far as primitive camping goes, I like going camping. I don't know if anybody else does, but that would not be my preferred spot to go camping, because you can eat a lot of mosquitoes out there if you can find a dry spot to camp in. So, well, I think it's an awesome idea to look into that, which is why we just asked the city to see if there was primitive camping, where could it be, and what would it take in order to do that, which is what the whole purpose of this meeting is for so that we can get more information so in the future if we choose to go that route where would be the best place how would we feel about it clearly your neighborhood doesn't want it right behind your house so thank you for giving us your input it makes it a lot easier to narrow down where it should be um, but most of what i have to say was uh, i wanted to hear about how expensive would it be what resources would we have to put in what infrastructure would we have to build clearly this is uh, not a simple yes or no so and it's very clear that if there is a park, it's not the park you wanted it. So, thank you for your input. All right, thank you, Ms. White. Good, uh, Mr. Stevenson, do you have a question to add? Um, this, I can tell you all, this all came directly from me. Uh, I went out on a tour out there and was just super excited. Uh, and I've heard, you know, I've got emails and comments and things from folks. Um, saying that, you know, I don't care about that neighborhood and things like that, which just couldn't be farther from the truth. I absolutely love that neighborhood. I think it's awesome. Uh, fantastic. And I go out there and just drive around because I just like it. And I stop and talk to people in the street just to say hello. I never tell them that I'm on city council. They don't know that. But when I do see folks out there, I'll just stop and talk to them. I have a feeling most of you are going to know who I am now. Uh, I don't do that anymore. But... Uh, some things, like, really, first off, I want you to know where it came from. When I, I think I might have been on planning and zoning board back at the time, and someone that lived over in that particular area uh, had made a comment one day, we are the forgotten part of Tiberias. And I go, man, I, I just felt so bad when the person said that. And I, and I go, that's not, you shouldn't feel that way. You know, whether it's true or not. You shouldn't feel that way. I don't feel that way where I live in Tavares. So that always bothered me. It's bothered me the whole time, all the years that I've been involved in this stuff. So I went over and started spending more time over there and then found out it was super awesome. And then I made some of these guys, we, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this on the record, we stole like the police boat and took the police boat. I had some folks with me. Uh, we went over there, and like, I looked at it from the water side. I mean, it was certainly authorized. Uh, so I went over and saw that and saw the dock, and the dock will put you in tears instantly. Uh, that dock uh, should be repaired, and, and it's being worked on. Like, everybody knows that should be repaired, no doubt. Um, but I just kind of fell in love with that area, and I fell in love with that nature park. It was 100 and something acres, and just awesome. So uh, I thought, like, because I have... Uh, I have primitive camp my whole life, thank you very much. Uh, so, having these fond memories, and the people that I've talked to, they have fond memories. Like, I remember going and, you know, like what it was like to wake up in the morning and the, you know, the bacon and the eggs and that type of thing, and fishing with my dad and stuff. Like, somehow, someone lied to you guys and told you, like, that I'm begging for this to be unsupervised, and that is just a flat-out lie, and whoever told you that I said that is lying to you. Because I never said that, and I never would, and I would never turn a park into some, like, homeless tenement and camp. That is not the idea. We have a serious homeless issue all across America that needs to be dealt with. That is not what I was trying to deal with, a suggestion that they put in the bathrooms there in order to bring homeless folks to, to this park is ridiculous. 
the suggestion that they're kicking people out of Eustis, so this issue is coming up right now as a result of that is ridiculous. This all came from me being fascinated by that nature park when I got to go out and see it for the first time. Uh, and I thought it was cool. Like, quite frankly, for a long time, I didn't know it was there. Uh, and I had, it had to be shown to me. And I go, we have this little gym. What a gym. What a beautiful thing we have in Tiberias. Man, I want to come use it. I think other people might like it. So I have all these thoughts. But let me, let me just straighten out a couple of things. Any suggestion that I said it should be unsupervised is a flat lie. It obviously has to be permitted. I would not support anything where you did not have to obtain a permit and pay a fee for the same. Now, if we wind up saying like that, ah, it's not worth the fee, I think you should have a permit because that absolutely tells you like who should be there and who should not be there. And I have primitive camp my whole entire life. We've always had to be permitted. We've always had to display it. That's the way it works when you go camping. This idea that people go camping to, to engage in sex and drugs and crime. Apparently, I was camping with wrong folks or something, man, because <laughs> I didn't have that experience. I've never had that experience, and I've never observed it in any camps I've ever been to in my whole entire life. Never seen that at, at any campground I've ever been to, and I've been to them my entire life. Obviously, you know, if you want to go camping in the middle of June in Florida, hey, good luck, man. You're not going to do that too often. There's not going to be a lot of that. Camping around here occurs late in the fall, early in the, what would that be? We don't really have winter, but people, uh, people everywhere else calls it winter. So it certainly would have to be uh, permitted. I think what it would cost, one of the things that got me excited about this idea was if we're going to do something like that, then we're going to have to be out there all the time. I would not support this if it was unsupervised. Part of what goes along with that is that people are going to be there night and day to see what's going on. And if you want to be a sex crazed, drug addict, whatever, you're not going to want all that attention. You're not going to want to be around legitimate campers. You're not going to want to be around law enforcement, city employees, anything like that. Anyone that might like ruin your good time. I, I think this would help eliminate the problem that already exists there. Listening to what everyone has said to me, there's already homeless, homeless folks living there. There's already condoms and tampons and drug paraphernalia and God knows what out there. So. I don't see how injecting law enforcement and injecting city employees into that area would increase that problem. That, that defies logic in my mind that that could possibly happen, that having it more maintained and more exposed and more patrolled would cause the problem to get worse in any manner within the realm of possibility. I, I don't see it. Uh, the whole idea that someone would be living there if that's not camping, I, I, I don't know, there's some confusion. I just think, like, you guys have been, just been fed all these untrue things. Yeah. This is not about you. Yeah. No. 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 I've always said this, 
I, I think the proper role of government, from my estimation, is health, safety, welfare. This is definitely a welfare. This is like a quality of life thing in my mind, because I don't see this as this, you know, drug-addled tenement. I don't see it that way. I see the campgrounds that I've been to. Uh, when you say that the doc needs repair, that's true, and I think everyone already knows that, but that's legitimate. Uh, and then, uh, of all people, uh, a different entrance. Great idea. Great idea. Uh, some of the other things that I just don't see, I made a list, we've talked about a lot of this, but I hope you guys understand uh, the thrust of all this was never to bring problems into your community. I love that community. I would not do that to you. I would not bring problems or invite problems into your community. That is not what I'm trying to do. That's about all I and uh, now we are um, vice chair of district. Yeah. Did you like to add this? Not really, but I am going to ask y'all myself because we were real quiet when all y'all stood up here. We didn't make remarks or respond. So if y'all would just let us finish in our deliberations, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I'm ready to make a motion when you get done. Yeah, so I I appreciate everybody showing up here. I know that this is. You know, a difficult, difficult situation, but I do ask you to please, please be respectful. Um, I've heard from many of you through emails, phone calls. I appreciate you showing up here tonight and voicing your concerns and your opinions. And believe me, I understand, um, you know, you don't want this in your neighborhood. I hear that. And I've always said, I take pride in answering all emails, all phone calls, listening to all the residents. I really, I really do appreciate. I really do appreciate people contacting me in the proper channels, coming here and speaking in turn, calling me. You have our emails. You can go on our website and get our all of our emails. You can all contact us at any time. We have our phone numbers on there. You can call us at any time. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you to try to get through things like this. And like I said, I try to listen to every single thing that everybody says, and I take all that into consideration. I listen to what our staff brings to us. I take all that information, and I always try to make the best decision for all of the citizens in Tavares. We've had groups in here before that I had to look them in the face and vote against what they were asking because I had to make a decision based on what was best for the entire city of Tavares, all 17,000 residents. But in this situation like this, 17,000 residents, they don't necessarily benefit from primitive camping being right in your backyard. So I completely understand all the issues that you brought up today. I completely agree with that. I see this as opening up a big can of worms. I don't think it's something that needs to be done there. I appreciate it. I'm not doing this for applause, really. I mean, and, you know, Mr. Stevenson, you know, he... He explained why he brought this to council. He explained why he had staff look into this. This is something that he thought about, and he wanted staff to look into it. Staff did a great job of looking into it, bringing it before council, and everybody is notified. That we have a council meeting here on the first and third Wednesday every single month at 4 o'clock. So you're more than welcome anytime. Please come and voice your opinions, listen to what's going on in your community. That's what we're here for. We want to hear from all of you. So thank you for that. But, you know, I have other concerns. Um, you know, in the future, we have a possibility of doing a, um, um, a parks comp plan that would tell us the direction that we want to go for our parks in the next five years. I want to see us do that. You know, right now, uh, it's been brought up the grant does allow primitive camping. But in the future, we might have other opportunities for other grants that might not allow for primitive camping. I mean, we might be looking at a grant to, to fix the dock. And what happens if we're looking at that grant and it states that you cannot have primitive camping in there? Then what do we do? We lose the money for that grant. So there's a whole bunch of other issues that this could bring about. Uh, you know, one thing that's brought up here, it says that the closest uh, primitive camping park is in Lake Louisa State Park. Well, why is that? Why don't other cities have parks? in Sunder City Limits. Obviously there's some kind of problem, so they don't want them there. So 
I would agree it's with what everybody said. I don't think this is something that we need to pursue any further. And that's uh, that's the way that I'm going. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over back to council and see what direction we want to move with this. I'd like to make a motion to approve option two to not pursue this any further. I'll second the motion. All right, we have an option, or we have a motion and a second to not approve this and not go any further with this. So um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 4-0 to not approve. Thank you. 
Alex, you, you said it? Yes, that's the okay. club that was providing that service. I mean, the Toastmasters had two meetings, right? There was one in the afternoon and there was one in the Were you the noon group or the afternoon the group? The noon group. Okay. But what, I, I mean, I think what you could do is uh, students shall attend a Florida Toastmasters Club meeting and attend to its favorite events. I think for now, I would remove it. Uh, and we'll need to look into how do we provide a safe, adequate um, you know, training on public speaking from someone who's actually you know, certified or you know, uh, qualified to do that. Uh, so I, wouldn't, I would remove it for now and then let staff develop a program that would be acceptable to the school board and the school and the, and the, and the, and the kids. Just to remove the public speaking training aspect, which is uh, number seven. And let me work with the school to figure out a way to get that, and then we can add it later. Um, I have a question about number five. Okay. Because they used to follow the department, and they did the chief department, they wanted to follow why they're not doing that anymore. Correct. They are coming to the meeting where all the departments come. They pick a department after they've heard the presentation. And so students will attend a morning department overview seminar. That's when they come and do the overview. Write a report about the functions of the department. So the police chief would give his overview of what they do. They'd write a report about that. Um, yeah. So the answer to your question is yes, they will not be shadowing departments anymore. I guess my concern is I know that that's one of the things they really enjoy about doing this program. Um, I still talk to Bill Quinn, she was my first uh, youth council shadow. And following Sony and the other programs, she's still going with a lot of work with track, she's still writing, writing her letters of reference and helping her go through uh, scholarship programs and letters. And using this is helping her. And she enjoyed how it interacted with government, such as a better appreciation of how law enforcement really works. So I really think for that part of it uh, to be discontinued, because I know that there are other people who are looking into finance and other parts of city government, they really enjoy shadowing someone, then having a point of reference if they wanted to use them as a mentor after the program. So. From what the school is saying is they don't have the time to have the students do four hours, two hours of a shadowing program. Now I had a meeting with them uh, probably in about two weeks to meet the students, talk to them about the program. Um, but from what we're getting from the school is that uh, students can commit about an hour to this program. And the shadowing um, for Was, was an issue now. I could talk to them again and say, you know, there was a great experience from shadowing for at least one student and probably more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a great way to uh, learn and maybe we could limit the shadowing program to two hours and, and fit into that. So I'd be, I could certainly ask the school if they'll reconsider their request to limit participation to one hour per student. I'd appreciate that. And okay. if I can make my uh, council member sit up here with me more often because I like talking to you as well. And was happening during the meetings. Instead of sitting in the audience just smiling, uh, smiling at me. What was that? You said one? You know how they have to sit up here and shadow us actually up here? Microphone. I, I want to try Microphone. I Microphone, please. I want to try and sit up here with me for more meetings. That's all. Because I like explaining the meeting and why they're on the agenda and what's happening. Um, I think they have a greater appreciation of sitting in the audience where they understand how it works. So right now we have them at how many meetings in the audience for? Yes. Uh, so would you like them two and two, three and one? Uh, just more than once. Two and two. Okay. okay. I think you could do that as an option. Or as no, I think we'll just do that. Their issue is one hour. The students cannot spend more than an hour in this program, like a course, like a class. So uh, right now, they'll spend an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour, four times out there. I think what I'm hearing is an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour. And I think that's fine. So they will leave one hour after the meeting from here twice. I think that's easy to accomplish. And I do want to recognize we have a sponsor <laughs> for the Mayor's Youth Council. We have uh, Ms. Kim Fox.
I'll interview you have anything that you'd like to say. I, mean, well, I always have something to say. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, my daughter was at the very first council, and it, it's an amazing program. I appreciate y'all continuing to do this so much. Um, public speaking is huge for kids. You know, I always tell them before they introduce themselves, loud and proud, we're going to go. And, hi, I'm so and so. You know, I mean, everybody's here. Not everybody can talk. Um, so I would love to make sure that we keep that in place. The job shadowing is huge. Um, it is their time. Um, it's not just um, also, you know, like the sports. They, a lot of these kids dual enroll. And Wednesday nights are when, because they get out of school early. Wednesdays are a lot of students dual enrollment days. So it cuts into that and affords, um, you know, youth functions and churches and such. So we totally appreciate you understanding that and limiting it to an hour um, for them to <laughs> drive. So it's getting parents to pick them up and such. But um, it's a wonderful program. Again, the mentoring is, is huge and public speaking is huge. And again, thank you very much for inviting us back. Quick question. <laughs> if we did the shadowing for a while, would that work? Oh, I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, we could um, do it on Friday, so 30 minutes of it is their um, home base or power hour, you know. So, they don't need to get a little bit of time. Thank you. And I, I do understand, you know, we, we had a number of students last time that was unable to come to some of the meetings, and, you know, just because of the time. So, I, I understand. I just want to make sure that, you know, we're doing what we can to make sure that students get the most out of it. Because I know that... Uh, like everyone that's been up here, they really enjoy their experience. Oh, yeah. oh, it's uh, so I think it's been a, a great thing. And it's, it's been good for, I think, us as well. I think we've learned a lot from the students, too. And, uh, so, Mr. Brewer, I, I understand on the, um, on the Toastmasters Club, I understand not making that a requirement, but maybe we can have something optional. We can still look at it and we can work with the school that's still possibly offer that. We just not make it a, a requirement that we have to complete that prior to their graduation. I think we work with Ms. Pauline and see if that's something that we can And we have a new principal. I don't know if you have the opportunity to meet him yet, but Mr. Stein is um, all for the program. He loves it. And he has some new connections also, you know, from the school. So maybe he has some connections with a public speaker that, you know, I just haven't approached enough like that. So I'll, you know, I'll stop him in the morning and we'll go from there. Um, we do have a new leadership class that's juniors and seniors. 22 children sitting in there, and I'm going to talk to you Friday morning to um, hopefully get some students so we can get started a little bit sooner and get them going. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Council, we have any other questions? I'll just wait my turn. I sit beside Ms. Vargas at every meeting. She never explains things to me or tells me about what we're doing. <laughs> she does say you're pretty bad. Yes. Sir. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have a different take on this because I was hoping that it would become meatier. I, I thought that we would be doing more with the students instead of taking away. So I'm just going to admit I'm very disappointed. And, uh, as far as kids, I remember when this when this first evolved, the Mayor Chief Council, I was kind of hoping to reach out to kids who weren't the kids who were going to football and cheerleaders. I was trying to reach the other kids that you might could say, even if in the program you saved one kid who went a different direction because of this program, you know, getting interested in government or getting interested in the police department because they really have no other way to have the interaction. So listening to y'all tell me people can't come because they have all these other activities, well then this program isn't for them. You know, I wanted to, I wanted kids who needed us is what I wanted. Kids, and somehow we do get kids who are the popular kids and the football players and the cheerleaders and, and that's what's happening, but that's what always happens. I mean, and I know that you don't have enough kids jumping up and wanting to do it, but what if y'all, the, the school actually looked at their students and thought, you know, this kid is on the fence, you know, bring him in and say, hey, we would like you to be part of this program. You know, instead of waiting for people to volunteer, sometimes kids 
you know, they don't volunteer. Sometimes you have to snatch folks and say, you need to do this. So this program is going in a different direction than what I had intended for it when it was first created. I, I wanted to help kids, not, not rearrange everything to make do for their busy schedules of football practice and cheerleading practice. That's not what it was about at all. So I'm not happy with the changes. I was hoping we could add more. Well, thank you, Ms. Fisher. No, I mean, it, and just, it's difficult. I mean, kids, like last year, I think we had uh, four students, uh, one didn't even finish. And I just want to make sure that, you know, I don't want to see the program go by the wayside. I think, uh, you know, whatever kids that we can get, whatever kids, I, but I think every kid that's been here, I think they've gotten a lot out of it. Yeah, I mean, there's, I understand, you know, trying to get kids that would need us, but we also need to get kids that want to participate in the program. So I'm just afraid that, you know, if, if we don't change it to accommodate the kids' needs, then I don't think we've had a program. And I think it's much better to have the program the way it is than not have a program at all. And that's, you know, my feelings. Again, that's when it was created. That wasn't the direction that I thought it was going to go. So, but it can you can easily change it. So, you're the mayor. You're you can change it. Ms. Paul, I am a big fan of this program, and um, I wasn't able to be involved with it last year. Um, I'm very eager to try and get all those kids. The only you know problem is you can't require kids to come to after school, and you don't need that. Um, and Unfortunately, there are those kids that you do want to, you know, see have the opportunity, but they just can't because of transportation. You know, it's huge. Um, we're liable if we drive them. You know, I mean, there's all those things. But like I say, I want to start early, and I, I understand exactly where you come from because people should be chomping up bits to get into this program. Um, it's, you know, for all kinds of reasons. But um, um, I will try my hardest. Like I said, I'm on. On your team, I, I I don't want to see the program go away, and if it does mean you have to make that one hour adjustment, it's unfortunate, <coughs> but we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Council. How do you want to go? Can I make a motion to approve with all suggested changes if they're feasible? All right. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carries three to one. We're going to move on to tab nine. Here we are, probably one of the hottest days that we've had. It's not raining at least, so that makes it even hotter. So we're going to move on to Christmas lighting design concepts. Ms. Tanner Rogers, I think this is you. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, this will be fun. It will be quick. And um, all opinions are welcome. And it's going to, you're going to love this. Uh, previously, we had asked uh, Joe Campbell, a representative from the Christmas Designers, to appear before you and present some ideas for this year's lighting program. And we asked him, you asked him to come back and uh, show uh, visually what uh, di the different colors on the boots of the tree, boots being the top of the palm tree, could look like. Um, all of you that you did not want to read any longer. So Joe has been asked to show us some visual aids, which I'm assuming you are the first ones you're going to show. He will be showing you red, I'm sorry, green, blue, gold, and multicolor. So that's d decision number one that I'm hoping you'll make tonight as a team. Uh, decision number two will be which tree do you want this year? Uh, we have options for two Christmas trees, no additional costs. One is for the 24 animated tree with all the bouncy, jumpy lights. Uh, the other is a color tree with a fixed twinkly light in white, or multicolor, whatever. Uh, so you get a bigger tree if you don't make uh, the lights move. And then thirdly, we have presented some other lighting options to you in the last meeting. 
And tonight we've got a lot to go. So uh, you can do one of two things. You can either say, uh, during my presentation, well, we have $5,000, we'd like to apply to number, whichever one of these options are, that are before you, or you can wait to make that decision when Lori makes her presentation and Amanda's saying yes, and that's probably the most logical pursuit, but I want to give you those options. So, Joe, take it away. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, we're going to start actually with the, uh, the tree first. Um, that's kind of the order we put it in. Uh, so, the... Uh, this is the current tree that you have now, and then this is the one that we could switch it over to. It's a 30-foot tree, so it'd be going from a 24-foot tree to a 30-foot tree. And you said that it could be another color. Uh, it didn't just have to be white on the larger tree. It could be any just one it. solid color. Correct. Okay. And those lights would twinkle. We would have to get a twinkle inside of there anymore. We have to see if the tree motion. Okay. Here's where we park with the cluster lights hanging down. <coughs> So there's your different options for the lights. There's no price difference in any of the colors. So it's more uh, personal opinion of what you like best. Do you have all the information that you need? We're trying to condense it so that it's yes. So take it away. Which tree you want? Was there also the choice of the color of the boot that they're 
there's no there's no instruction on this one. Right. So right. There's the there's tree and the uh, the palm tree. Maybe. So we think we could decide on the tree yeah. and then the. Is that going door. down Main Street? That's Correct. That's uh, that's all the uh, all the single palms. Yes. They used to be <coughs> they used to be red at the top, white at the bottom. Correct. And there was concern about that scheme. So that would be something you could decide, but there's no cost for that. What do you want on the palm trees as compared to last year? Good point. So you have two things you can decide that are no money issues, right? All right. So you want to talk about the, the tree, you want the larger tree that only has that's one color, right? Correct. And it'll twinkle. So if, if you have the warm white tree, tree. <laughs> yeah, if you have a warm white tree with have uh, a clear twinkle. I believe it's every fifth ball would be a twinkle ball. Or it could be a multi colored light string. I like the larger tree. I like the multi colored lights. It's just. So the multi, it could be multi color or micro. Uh, it, it, it could be multi color. The larger tree. The larger tree could be one multi color? Yes. Or one color. Okay, because you buy multicolor together just like you would buy a solid. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. The reason being is you know how much I am about branding, but I feel like that tree is all about the kids to me. So I'm good with a multicolor on the tree in Tavari Square. I agree. What, what do you think about that? <laughs> You all see how I dress. I'm not sure you should be asking me a lot. I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, I just, I'm looking for someone to agree with right now. <laughs> 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 Okay, well then, let me say something else. Um, just, 
I, I still, the multicolor Maria look like every other city. We need to, we've always been, we've always been about standing out. We always have been. We do things differently. Why do we want to be multicolored? I know in the world is evil. Oh, let's drive into berries and see the multicolored lights just like they have here, you know. But if you say, hey, let's go to Tiberius, man, I get all those blue and white lights, you want to see them, and it's so cool. It's all done in blue and white. Or even at the professional clothes, the, the blues don't look good. <laughs> so they get I know, hey, I, 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 I have deeper. picture after picture here that I can show you of yeah. cities who do blue and white or blue and silver, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. I still think people will definitely drive this. Our entire Main Street lit up and just coming down that Main Street and seeing all the lights. I, I think uh, people would still drive uh, various berries and they would still love to see our lights. And that way we can also see what uh, the blue looks like at the gateway. We make that decision next year. You know, that way it would be different every year. And like I said, that's, I think what's nice about having this uh, company, we can have different lights every year. That way uh, people can come next year and say, hey, I wonder what looks very different this year. Do you reuse the lights or are we going to be paying more? Or are we not? No, no, no. We reuse them. We reuse them. Yeah. You reuse them? That's what I was thinking also. You're just talking us right out of the discount. I mean, you're talking to us right out of the discount by changing the, by changing the lights every year. I understand this. If you're changing the lights every year, uh, that's going to be a consideration with the price. If, if we're paying this and they know you're going to use it year after year, tell them the truth. Just no, that would, it would be a new problem. It would be a change in price. If it was changed, so would it be a change in price? If it's changed yearly. Common sense. Yeah. Well, common sense. I mean, this is going to be budgeted. They're budgeted the lights. They're budgeted in the price. Yeah, they're using the, that. Yeah, I wasn't under that impression. So the blue lights don't look so bad now, do they? You want to every year forever? <laughs> <laughs> He's been thinking that one. <laughs> they do look pretty good. So what kind of price difference are you talking? I couldn't say right now, but if we do, when we when we do our contracts, we price the lights in according to the light of the lights. So, so even though the lights are two years old, they are there's a light set up of, of three years that you guys were willing to work with you. So that's why we're giving you the option to choose. Still try to make up his mind. See which way they swing. Does anyone in the audience like to come and comment? This is uh, going to be your decorations as well. It'd be nice to, to have some input. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go get him. Denise LaRod of Royal Harbor. I tried so hard not to say anything tonight. <laughs> That's my goal. I spoke about this last time. And Troy and Amanda, I'm sure you're not going to like this, but I am on Lori's uh, side on this position. Tavares has spent, I don't know how much, millions of dollars branding Tavares, and it's blue and silver and white. Tavares used to be all white. Wooten Wonderland was gorgeous when I came here. It was all white. It was beautiful. But you know what? Now Dora's all white. And then they have the other area down by the marina that's very different, but that's the marina that actually influenced that, and it's all kinds of stuff down there. Tavares is Tavares, and the branding is critical on Tavares. And I will have to say, I think blue and silver is the way to go, because you will have the multicolored tree, that's the traditional Christmas, and that's where all of the activities are going to be anyway for all the kids and everybody else. Coming into Tavares with a branding color, I think, just exposes more people to the brand. It reinforces the brand of the city. And personally, I have to say, I have some trouble with a vendor who states that you shouldn't do something, when the vendor, to me, should just be implementing the suggestions and showing the pictures that you require. And if you'll look at the pictures again, I think you'll see that the blue is very pretty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodgers. Thank you, Ms.
about it. Uh, Jay Cunningham, 311 Woodview Drive. Uh, I'm for the multicolor lights. I have a young son. That's what he's all about, driving down the road, sees the lights, wants to go with fuel. If you have just blue and white leading that way, it doesn't entice you to head to the park. Um, and the lights are for the citizens to enjoy, not to attract new uh, income. So that's my stance on it. Thank you. Thank you. Diana, 810714 North St. Clair Abrams Avenue. I have to agree with uh, the mayor that maybe we should do the blue at the entrance and see how well it's received. Multicolored gray children, they're going to love colors. Um, though our brand is blue and white, we can just see where that goes and then maybe put that into the budget for next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayden. Anyone else in the audience? Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> I can't get no respect. Fans, <laughs> you're from 12619. I just, my view is that uh, why are you spending all this time talking about colors and lights? I think I'd leave it up to the uh, community, community services director and uh, proceed to other things because I'm all excited to hear about the budget. Anyone else? All right, we've got to make a decision. And, and just one more thing to make it more exciting in Wooten Park. Remember, I had already said in the Wooten Park area it needed to be multicolored because the kids are there. You know, and as you come out from that, then we just start doing our drop lights and whatever, you know, the white, like you showed in the picture, because that's absolutely beautiful. I don't know. I, mentioned this before about Brook Green Gardens up in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, I went out there last year just to look at it because of our dilemma with Christmas lights and uh, it was just magical. I mean it was beautiful. All the you know when you showed the what do you call those kind? The, the cluster lights. The cluster lights, man, gorgeous. Yeah the ones I get straight down. I'm gonna stick with the uh, the multicolored lights and then Blue with the uh, gateway. Spotters. I would like the multicolored lights with the blue lights at the gateway. Mr. Stevenson. I, I think I'm going to agree with you guys. It's compromised. <coughs> compromised with the blue with the gateway. You ought to give us a discount if these blue are dark and they're so awful and all that. Mm -hmm. Give us a huge discount. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I got to go with the compromise. We'll go multicolored. Guys talking about his little kid and stuff. And then, like, it makes me more. So, multi lights downtown, blue, or I think we're going to talk about the lights out of our normal one. They go right now, blue and white out there. Let's see what it looks like. Yep, and I'm um, majority rules, so um, I'm going to have to be in agreement because that's what you do here. But uh, I'm still. You're on the record. I'm on the record you're as agreeing. I think you're on the record as you prefer that. Oh, I prefer, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and agree because that's, that's how you do things here. But, yeah, I'm hoping now that we vote in the gateway because it's just... So we're going to do multicolor coming downtown, too? All the palm trees are going to be multicolor? Um, I know, but I feel like it's going to take away from our big, giant, multicolor Christmas tree now. I mean, it's the excitement of... I don't know, that's... I look at things differently, so I'm one of those outside of the box people, so. And we do have the gateway already on here, is that correct? Uh, that was, that was yeah, one of the additional score. Uh, we have to decide. Yeah. You have, not to compound things, but you could arbitrarily go $5,000 right now, here and now, to select that, or you can wait and parlay that 5000 with any additional money that we're always going to identify and get a bigger ticket, or it might be that ticket. I know it's very confusing because we are designing by committee, and it gets a little confusing. So, so the $5,000, so where it has the no charge, we can choose one of these five options right here. Okay. Right here and now, you could, or I could wait until we're going to presentation. Yeah, I could 
too. I don't want to see us spend any more money. I want us just to go ahead. We've got five thousand dollars. If we can do the um, optional lighting at the Chris Daniels Park, I mean, I would rather go ahead and make that decision now because I don't want to see us spending any more money. I know that I care see if we have any additional savings from the budget we can add to that five thousand dollars to spend on in total or we can use that five thousand dollars now and then whatever the balance is after tap 13 we can then take that money either use it for one of these topics put it in reserves or spend it on something else so we can either spend the five thousand dollars now or we can wait till we see how much money Lori saved us to add to that and then see if we want to spend any of that money on any of these additional add-ons like the gateway the eco park the vertical clusters or the light and sequence. Well, I think we for sure want to do the gateways. We just made that agreement. Yes. So I would say let's go ahead and vote on that with the five thousand dollars going to the forty four. So we've got six hundred bucks for the our cluster. Right? So we can go ahead and make that decision. So we decided on the, the motion. Do we need a motion we'll put that on this? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, that we to the optional um, lighting at the entrance entrance sign. So that's just one entrance sign. That's just the one down here. Okay. The entrance sign and the uh, retention pond. So I have a question that we do that and with, with the blue and silver and then uh, we have changed the other colors to multicolor and we're going for the larger tree with multicolor. I'll second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, four to zero. Thank you. So then we can come back around to this. Through the clusters, you too. And if you don't have any other questions for Joe, we'll send him back to Pompano Beach for our ahead of him. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Very much for the presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, so we're done with Christmas. We're going to move on to tab 10, water, wastewater, reclaim, utility rate study presentation. Let's go. Mayor, members of council, I don't know how to follow Christmas lights, <laughs> but we'll try. We'll, we're committed to do our best here. Okay, we have a, a rate study presentation scheduled present to you and a little background on this is in order to meet revenue sufficiency requirements for water, wastewater, reclaim, and stormwater debt, which includes bank loans, bonds, state revolving loans, a utility rate study for the utility funds is generally accomplished every five years. A little background of the history so far in recent past. A rate study was completed in May 2009 and presented, presented to Council on June 18, 2009. The study recommended an annual rate increase for water, wastewater, and reclaim of 1% plus CPI. And that recommendation was approved by way of Ordinance 2009-22, October 1, 2009. A subsequent rate study was done in September of 2014 and presented in November 2014. That study recommended no change, so the 1% plus CPI stayed intact. A current rate study has been completed, and you've been given a complete copy in your agenda packet, by the city's rate consultants, Reptelis and Associates. The study recommends a slight increase in water and with a small increase in the sewer rates to equalize our rates. Um, Joe Williams of Reptelis and Associates um, will present to the board, if that is the wish of the board, this, the rate study results to this board after the presentation. Staff recommends um, that you move forward and accept the, the study so that, and ask staff to bring back to this board an ordinance um, and set a public hearing date of September 11th. For the, for the residents. And if council, uh, mayor, if you please, I'll, I'll 
I'll leave it up to Joe to give you a presentation. Yes. Thank you, Lori. And good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council members. Uh, I guess you get back to back up a little bit higher. Just get back to back. Joe's here. Um, and Joe Williams with Cartellus. And um, just want to, you know, mention that we, we did one-on-one -on -one meeting back in back in March and kind of went over the findings of the study and we're here to formally present them to you now. Um, the utility has been managed really well over time by staff and by the decisions you've made to make investments and improve the system. And everything looks really good and we're here to um, show you some option um, or a recommendation that we have that is going to have lower impacts to your customers over a four-year period than um, otherwise would happen with your current markets. So it's, it's a very positive presentation. <coughs> and you're experiencing a lot of growth, which is, is contributing and um, helping keep the system strong. Okay, so we'll first start with a brief um, overview on utility systems and then get into the findings and recommendations. So enterprise funds, you have your water, wastewater, reclaimed water, and the storm water. And the purpose of the enterprise funds is that the rates that you're setting should fully fund the activities of providing these services. They're set up as business units and you're, you're currently meeting your obligations your, to your debt holders and to your, to your budget, budgeted expenses, your capital requirements. You're meeting all those and we're striving to maintain that. And so a quick look at your current rate structure. Um, each month, your customers are paying a base charge for having access to clean water and for you taking the sewer away as well. Um, there's major capital investments that go into the utility uh, system. You have your major plants and then you have all your lines in the ground it's all very capital and um, intensive, very expensive. So this, this is a means of recovering some of your ongoing costs um, on a monthly basis. And then to help with equitability, we look at, okay, if customers use more, they're going to pay more for the, for the water that they use and the wastewater that they send back. And um, in Florida, there's you know, it's a growing population. Everyone has somewhat limited water supply to a degree, so you all have inclining block rates, which promote conservation. As you use more, you can start to pay a little bit more. And there, there's a lot of um, theories and studies that go into why why that is, and the biggest one is water conservation. Um, otherwise, you all would have to go look for new water supplies, which costs um, extremely higher amounts than your current water supply. And these are all inside city customer rates. You have some outside city customers, and they pay an extra 25% surcharge as well by floor statues. And then the reduced water, um, it, it, there's a slightly different structure. Um, there's, there's reasons why there's benefits to the city if there's, if there's any large users that take the reused water from you. There's regulatory requirements on how you discharge your wastewater and if you're actually selling it and giving it to golf courses or agriculture, it's, it's better for your regulation. So we, we reflect that with the rates, yeah. potentially lower rates. And reused water is um, somewhat of a lower quality than potable water. It's out for outdoor use only. And you can see that we have lower lower rates for reused water than potable water to reflect that as well. And stormwater um, $10 per month for a typical single, for, for a single family home. Non-residential customers get scaled up based on the impervious area. And all the, all the impervious area was reviewed recently by staff um, and updated according to the property appraiser. <coughs> and so local rate comparison, this is going to be for a water and wastewater bill. Um, it might be a little small on the screen here. Uh, but Tavares is, is in line with the other local utilities around, and which is a, a great feat because you've made some very significant infrastructure investments the past five, ten years. Um, your system is very new, it's in very good condition. So the fact that your rates are, are still really well in line with others is, is a good story. 
and some brief overview of your current city code. Every year on October 1st, you have an automatic increase to your rates of inflation as measured by the CPIU index, plus 1%. Um, there's also a minimum of 1% if, if the inflation had actually gone negative. So what's going to be uh, presented to you is going to be different than the inflation plus 1. And over a four-year period, we're anticipating that the recommendation would be lower than the inflation plus 1 would be. And to start with the rate study results, since you have the inflation plus 1 in your code now, that's going to be the first scenario that we'll look at here. And then we'll show you the recommendation and the differences. And your, so your funding of about a $32 million capital program over the next five years. Um, and that includes um, what was going on this year. So your, what you're looking at in your budget is going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's probably extending out next year to so buy your capital. But you are relying heavily on SRF loans. So those are from the state of Florida. Um, they're very subsidized <coughs> loans, very low interest rates. And for large investments, it really helps you spread the costs um, of that from existing users to the future users who are going to benefit from the use of the assets as well. And that's a way to help keep your rates down um, so you're not having to recover all that money from your current residents. And the summary of some of the major major projects that you have going on are Devlin Park. Um, there's going to be some significant investment there, but then there's going to be a lot of the utility customers to help pay back that investment plus the other investments that it's made over time. Um, and then just a, a list of other projects. I know that um, you know Phil has these thought out really well, and um, I, I know there's there's certain you know touch points on each one and why they're being done, and they're all they're all fully funded through this program and in our recommendations as well. So the revenue sufficiency forecast. Um, if you continued inflation plus one percent. Um, the forecast is that on average it's going to be about two and a half percent a year inflation plus the one percent, so three and a half percent increase on your rates. And this is what the revenue sufficiency looks like over time. You can see the blue bars there are really large. That's the water system. The green, which you can't always see until you look towards the very right side, is sewer rates. So what we've what we've done in our recommendations is we brought We've looked at the despair, a little bit of disparity there is between the water and the sewer right now, and we have a program to, to uh, bring those back in line. Um, but overall, the utility is financially strong. You're able to fund your, fund your capital program, meet your debt covenants from all your, your loan holders, the bond holders, the banks, um, your revenue sufficiency, and importantly, to maintain reserve balances, which in in utility systems is extremely important because, we, as we mentioned, you have a $30 million capital program. That's only a fraction of what your utility system is worth. And so we set minimum, and, and most of your operating costs are fixed, you know, it's salaries and debt service. So whether you're selling water or not, you're having these expenses going, and you need the revenues coming in, and the fund balance is available to be able to pay those um, if, if timing there's time issues on revenue collections. So overall, again, just to reiterate, very strong um, financially, all your bondholders and SRF and bank, bank loans are going to be very happy with the financials of the, of the utilities. So our recommendations, as I mentioned, so we're, we're looking at some, we're actually looking at a reduction of 1% on the water rates coming year and then keeping the water rates flat for the next three years and then on the sewer um, two two increases of five and a half percent and then a, a smaller increase of two percent and then zero percent so in the fourth year there's no rate increase that would be adopted and a, a combined so we looked before at the on the chart at the comparison of where your customers are compared to other local cities um, those same customers at 4,000 gallons would change, on average, over the four-year period by just under 2%, where if we just kept the inflation plus one, we're 
we would anticipate that would be closer to three and a half percent per year. So this this is going to be a lower overall increase than what you would otherwise have. And what the lower increase does to your your sufficiency you, before it was sort of a U shape. There's some there's some new expenses coming on, and then with the inflation plus one, you you bounce back up in the later years. Here we have a more managed approach where you can see the blue bars, which is the water, are, are shrinking, they're being more managed over time, and the green bars jump up above the zero line um, right away with the 5.5% rate increases that we showed there, um, and the offsetting negative one, and then zero is on the water. So overall, you're, it's still, you're still in very strong condition, and as I mentioned before, fund balances, and to explain this one a little better, we have the, we have the bars going up and down, which is the projected balances that you have, and the lines going across are the targeted minimums that we have for each fund. And each of your funds is meeting or exceeding the minimum balances. And since um, bondholders and um, SRF, again, they're, they're the biggest stakeholders who are looking at this, and your existing uh, customers, this is very important because you don't want to have small small changes under a capital program trigger you having to come back and all of a sudden need rate increases right away because you don't have any funds available to manage how the utility is running. So that, that's another very important part of why reserve funds are important. Um, and so that is, I'll say that those are our recommendations and the ordinance that will come back to you will suspend the CPI plus 1%, the language will still be in there, and it'll push it out one year beyond this period. It's a, in 23-24, the language for inflation plus 1% will come back in. But as Lauren mentioned, every five years, typically you can do great studies, and prior to that inflation plus 1% continuing again, we'd be doing another rate study to see if it was necessary to be implemented at that level or some other level like we're recommending here. <coughs> any questions, is there, is there All right, thank you. So just for clarification with this, <coughs> this would be um, less of an increase. Correct. So you're talking about 3.5 increase if we don't do anything go with this, it's a 1.95 uh, increase. Right. Okay. right. right. Yes. <coughs> and then, so we're taking really good care of our infrastructure. Yes, yeah, so you guys have done tremendous, tremendous investment um, in your infrastructure. Council. Do you want to say something, Lori? I just, I just wanted to clarify, the 1.95% is the average over I do. We have we have went back and forth. My inbox has been extremely busy. Good. Yeah. He's giving us good advice. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Stevens. That's about all I can say. We're going to rely on. That's why we hired. Him. So we rely on. Him, right? and, and I will add that um, going back to Lori's introduction in 2009 and 2014 studies. Um, those were by Mike Rocca, who's still working with me. He, he's um, not feeling well tonight. That's why he's not here. Um, but he, he has, you know, 15 and 20 years of history with the city and is, was extremely involved in the study as well. Thank you. I'll move to approve the water, wastewater, reclaim utility user fee rate study and instruct staff to bring back the ordinance for public hearing for the board's consideration and provide the required utility bill message for the public hearing as required under the board statutes 183.136. Second. We have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 4 0. Move on to tab. Tab number 11. Request from the Lake County Museum of Arts Community Service. Yes, thank you. Uh, we received a letter from uh, Lou Huegas, who are you here? Okay, good. Uh, requesting that council consider.
consider uh, supplying the LCMA, Lake County um, Museum of Art, with a liaison for their board. Um, they are asking that one you consider certain board. And Lou, I'm sure you might have some additional comments. So you have the letter in your agenda packet, and it's up to you um, to make that decision. Thank you. Ms. Weiss. Good evening, I know it's been a long night, so I'll, I'll be really brief. Um, we'd love to have one of you serve uh, be the liaison on our board. Um, we try to keep the meetings very effective, efficient, and timely uh, first to the second Tuesday of the month. And it'd be great to have someone out there. Thank you. Right now, I'm serving as representative for the Canadian you know, cities, I'm serving as representative for the chamber, uh, the race relations committee. Alternate for the NBO and also the school emergency uh, representative. So uh, I just read the wealth. Is there anyone else? What time on the Tuesday? It's 5 30. Where? It is at the museum. Okay, and we're usually out of here by, by 6 30 or so. Unless Ms. Vister really wants to do it, or what is it? I'll volunteer. You can always spread my curve. I'm sure you would love it. Microphone, please. Yeah. He was asking if someone's going to be on the board of the Lake County Museum of Art or just going to be a liaison to the board of the Lake County Museum of Art. We said just the liaison. Correct. You will not be voting on any matters. The board will be. But the liaison is very helpful of capacity to have in there. This will you report back to the school board and that kind of thing. They serve as the same as the chamber, basically. So I'm more than happy to attend the meetings and just report back to the city. You'll just text me and remind me that I need to walk across the street to the after work to go to meetings. I'm sure our board would love to have you. Right. So, sounds like uh, we need to vote on that. So, there you go. You've got this August. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We already did tab 12, unless we want to do that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to budget workshop. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Um, this is one of your, your final workshop before we begin the public hearings in September. Um, previously, this council has reviewed the FY20 proposed budgets. And on July 3rd, the, at the city council meeting, uh, staff presented the FY2020 proposed general fund budget. At the July 17th City Council meeting, uh, staff presented the utility funds and special funds proposed budget for the FY2020 budget, after which Council had opportunity to discuss general fund budget as well as the utility and special funds. And then at the July 24th to, uh, City Council budget workshop, the City Council discussed the general fund budget and discussed the um, cut list and set the maximum tentative millage rate at 6.950 and the voted debt service millage rate at 0.2932. Staff has updated the budget. In reviewing the state estimates for revenues, we have lost $32,024 in our revenue estimates. We've reduced them. But the good news is, is we've regained savings in our health insurance true up of $47,756. Therefore, we have a savings of $15,732 um, that we bring back to this board to make a decision and determination of how they would like to allocate or appropriate those funds. There is an exhibit in your agenda summary it gives several options that staff listed that council may wish to add to this, but this is just a starting point for the board. Um, there's a theater group request for $1,500, a Christmas light add-on cluster lighting for $11,520. There's a choice of Christmas Lord, lights. Can you, can, can you all be good with exhibit A? Okay. Is everybody on exhibit A? All right, can you read the, the options again, starting at the beginning? Yes, I will. So one, are you on exhibit? All right, go ahead. There, a theater group request for 
theater group request for $1,500. Christmas light add-ons for cluster lighting, nine trees, $11,520. Christmas lights add-on at Echo Park for $4,400. Christmas light add-ons at the 441 Fountain Entrance, um, $6,200. I think you already um, took care of that one. Volleyball flight pole for $3,500. And then there is increased road paving that, um, as an option. Um, an item from the cut list as an option. Increased reserves as an option. Um, any other um, city council directed initiative or a combination of any of the above. And the, board, the staff will be more than help, uh, pleased to assist any way we can. Thank you, Ms. Houghton. Ms. Houghton, uh, the five thousand dollars we had allocated for additional things for the Christmas lights, we have six hundred dollars left. Does that go towards the total? That is correct. It will. So it would really be sixteen thousand three hundred thirty-two dollars. We have we have six hundred dollars, correct? Right. And I'm going to go ahead and say what Kirby Smith would like to say if he was here. He'd say, let's put that in reserves. And my personal opinion is we don't put do reserves, we could probably put it towards street meeting. And I know it sounds like a home book, because the vertical lines are really pretty. We have estimated uh, to end next fiscal year with the proposed budget before you at a 6.2% reserve level. That is $1,181,934 is what we estimate. And where's that? Where's our percentage of location? That is 6.2% of the appropriations in the budget. And uh, remind me again about, because I see this on here, we already had money for the lights we already approved. Where was That was something that was already budgeted, correct? Correct. What did we already have budgeted? No, we spent the $44 million on the lights. But, I know, but here it's showing differently. Here it's showing lights. Here it's showing 441 Fountain Entrance, $6,200. It, it's a type of order. It's a type of cash. The entrance is forty-four hundred. Okay. The eco park is sixty-one twenty, and I think those numbers got twisted. So we know sixty-one twenty. Okay. So we still have we didn't quite spend it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to agree with the road paving. I think we need to increase the road paving. I'm going to agree. Yeah. <laughs> 
change your police car because you got to downsize me. But yeah, um, I do want to bring up one thing. I know that this is in here in the theater group request. I was just going to point out we have in our community grants, we have $2,000, and I know that they had sent a request for the $1,500. Something just to maybe think about um, is maybe take that community, because this wouldn't affect any of these numbers. If we took that community <coughs> grant, I think we're offering, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Ray, um, four $500. Community grants. That's the way we usually run the program. Uh, you can apply in October for a community grant. There's uh, $500 per grant. So I can apply for a $500 grant. Or, so give them $500. Well, we could do that. We could have them apply for that, or we could we could give them $1,000, and then we could reduce our community grants to so $1,000. We could offer two $500. And what you could do too is um, have all the folks that are applying for those community grants do what they normally do is um, develop proposals. And then you could see the proposals because they're competing against each other, right? You might have 10 requests, and then you'll have a pretty good idea. Um, you know, for example, this theater is not really doing work right now in Tavares. So fundraising to hopefully someday build a building or finish a building for that. There might be another um, request for something that you find is going on right now that's important. So the options are to let them know that they can apply for the community grant, put their proposals together, and then uh, you'll look at the four applications of the six and then make a decision. Or I think what you're maybe suggesting is to, to uh, split the two community grants of larger numbers. So that's a decision for you. Right now, it will be four, five, about $500 community grants. We put an advertisement in October. We say for those who have, uh, want to apply for community grant, you have 60 days to put your application together and let us know what grant you're looking for that we think serves a valid public purpose. Uh, and then it comes to you and you know, we send a regime. Yeah, I, I like that idea better. I don't want to give away all that money and don't know what else is coming up, so right. I'd let them apply for it the normal process. Yeah, so I just want to point that out because that was one of the things I'm hearing. Yeah, I would love to have the clusters, but yeah. That's a lot right now. Yeah, I would have grants that uh, save that money, put it in reserves or road repaving. I think we could always use that money to, to repay some roads. And I just, I think that we might get a little bit more bang for a buck if we use that for road and paving rather than mm -hmm. the reserve where we can split it in half and have the reserve half in uh, road and paving. Well, hey James. Hi. How far would $16,332 be? <laughs> <laughs> well, not far with resurfacing the preservation would be at least a block or two. It's city. Remind me of our cut list. Because I don't have it in front of me. I just want to hear about the cut list because to see what. Could we also just keep in mind that this is extra money we can decide in the next one? Okay. Council can check that. Okay. So we can revisit the budget so we can have the amount of money we have to see if there's something. We will 
come back to you with a budget so we would show it in a contingency line item within the budget? So we can so we can always go take table this until the next meeting and know how we're gonna use this money and then give us all time to go through that list or see where we want to put it. We would include it in a as an expenditure line item called contingency and then you can decide it at the have to bring you back a, a, a resolution that has a finite number, so that's what we would do. We would, and I think if John agrees, we would show that if they are unable to make a decision tonight, we can show the 16232 in a contingency line item. Yes, and they can I think that's a pretty good idea because if you can go through that whole cut list, uh, dive into it over the next uh, couple of days, then we come in September with a public hearing. If you see something on the cut list that you go, you know, that was something we really like. I know we have a contingency of, what did you say? 16,000. Um, there's something on the cut list that I cut that you would like to put back in. You have 16,000. If you say, you know what, let's put it all in the reserves, put it all in the reserves. So we'll give you a balanced budget for the September public meeting that will have a line item called contingency for $16,000. And it is in that meeting you would uh, appropriate it to either reserves or a cut item. That's what I would like to do. Do I need to make a motion? And you can make a, a motion to that effect. In a second, we'll do that. Uh, and then, uh, well, I'd like to make a motion that we not decide how to spend the remaining funds that are not allocated, have them listed as a contingency line item on the finalized budget. And then we have the opportunity to decide whether to pull something off the compass or allocate it to reserves or roads at the next meeting. That works. I'll second that. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. As a reminder, we have two public hearings in September. They are. September 4th at 5.05. 5.05 and September 11th, there's 5.05. September, what's the other one? 11th. 11th, 5.05. So in the state of Florida, you have to set a specific time for budget hearings. We're here from the public. And that is at 5.05. It's a lot of regular council meeting. They'll be talking, and all of a sudden, we'll stop the council meeting. We'll start the public uh, budget hearings at 5.05. <coughs> we will take public input from the public on the budget. It will be read into the record where things stand, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we close public comment, the council will make a decision. And then they'll do it one more time again on September. I, I, it's September 18th. 18th. I apologize. September 18th. September 18th will be the second time we do it. Same thing at 5.05. We read where the balance budget is in, we take public comment, and then we um, bring it back to the council, and then you make your final decision on the final budget and you don't debate all that good stuff. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on to new business, and we added the good uh, bargaining for the fire Councilmember uh, Bobby Grenier was on the management team for uh, the last several years on negotiating the uh, collective bar bargaining agreement with the uh, Tourist Fire Department. Uh, I'm looking for someone to join us as we will start bargaining uh, probably in the next two weeks. In the next two weeks. What time of day? We work around your schedule. So what, we'll, what we do is we take, uh, we, we look at your schedule, and tell us your schedule, and that's when we set the meetings. I just know we're all smaller. Very good. We have a representative of the management team. We'll work around your schedule. Yes, sir. We're all in. Congratulations. Congratulations, boys.
we have a new regime up in the up in Tallahassee and things are a little bit different and everybody's gotten settled in, do you think it's time that we go back with our golf cart crossing on 441? I think it's time, new people, new faces, new leadership, somebody may just want us to have this. People are already doing it, so it's the United States. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Was you asking your, your colleagues or me? I'm telling, I said to them, and it looks like everybody's in agreement. Now I'm looking at you saying, I'm going to get it done. All right. <laughs> we'll get it done. That's awesome. All right. Any other old business? All right. We're going to move on to historical perspective. Severity's Historical Society. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hello, Brenda Smith, President of Severity's Historical Society. Miss Betty couldn't make it tonight because she, tomorrow she's going to have the cataract surgery so she can see. Anyway. Uh, so I thought that since you're talking about the budget and, you're, and this is a school year and all, I thought I'd just bring up a few things that happened in the past, since this is history. Uh, August the 12th, 1960. Property increased one half million dollars in Tavares during the past year. Now, you all are discussing the budget, and believe me, they had the same things back then. Assessed valuation and personal property on the 1960 tax roll amounted to $10,000, $10 million, $286,386, according to the city clerk, per trend, an increase of $580,000 over 1959. Assessed valuation of all property in the city in 1959 was $2,697,000. The tax millage was 16 mills for the year. The reappraisal program jumped the asset valuation above the $9 million figure and made it possible to reduce the tax millage to $6 million. So I think that was a pretty good thing for them to do. Now, around this time, there were 12 new students registered at the high school. The committee wishes to extend a welcome to the 12 new students who registered August the 9th and 10th when registration was held for newcomers to the school and they printed their name in the paper. Now we go 10 years ahead, September the 4th, 1969. The Tiberius School opened on September the 2nd with an even greater increase over last year's first day enrollment with a total of 1,121 pupils. Last year's total was 1,004. Figures show that 530 students enrolled in elementary school and 591 in high school. A total increase of 117 pupils over the last year's figures. Now this one's going to really get to you. <laughs> so, 10 years ahead, August the 22nd, 1979. The Tavares City Council passed on second reading Wednesday the city's new $1.25 million budget for the fiscal year. Though the budget was unanimously approved on first reading two weeks ago, Councilman Jimmy Connor changed his vote this time around. Connor based his negative vote on objection to the city's pay raises which went as high as 38% for the city administrator, Brenda Von Hartman. The new budget allows for a 5,500 annual raise from Ms. Von Hartman and a $5,000 raise from Public Work Director Roger Petula. With the raises, both salaries would be $20,000. As an alternative, Connor suggests that given the raises over a two-year period, he suggests his suggestion was not approved by the council, and the council but budgeted was once again accepted. And then we have the headlines. Councilmen approved the new budget. They, they approved it four to one. So to accept this $125 million budget. 
So the new budget is more than $325,800 larger than the last year's budget. So they had their problems back then too. There was a big fight about that. I remember that. <laughs> so anyway, and Brenda Von Hartman, by the way, was a great administrator. So on a lighter note, and since we are in an election cycle, in the 1979 Barry Citizens article, the tally sheet states, now this is the language of Florida lawmaker changes and increases in vocabulary every year. Some of the favorite slang phrases coined by the past legislators included pepper dust, ultra alley, and turkey. Now here are some of the latest additions to the legislators' lingo. Concept. What a committee talks about when its members are not ready to vote on an issue. Deep freeze. To commit a bill to a hostile subcommittee. In other words, bury it or kill it. That dog won't hunt. An outdoorsman's way of saying he doesn't believe a piece of legislative will pass. And jerking the nail, a, syn a synonym for being agitated. So you see, history can be a little aggravating. We can learn a lot, but it can also be fun. So when you hear someone say that that dog will come, y'all will know now what it means. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. And did you say that bill was six, six mil? Six mil. Six Went down from 16. And, and what year was that? Uh, 
distant is where the car riders line up. And they line up back to Aesop's Park when school's getting out. It, it's crazy. And with all the building now and all the new students that are going to be going to Tiberius, it's going to get even worse. But I've had to call the school board because school buses are still trying to come down. And the road where my house is is so narrow. Man, the inches they miss the sign, the public signs like the speed limit signs. And they're still coming down this end, fighting with the cars. Let me get with you. Uh, let me find out about the school bus situation so I get a better answer for you. And I'll give you a call and I'll find out how to deal with that. And then we added the additional sign as well. Really. Okay, what about uh, speed bumps? I mean, is the city, I've researched a little bit, and it's this code, city code allow speed bumps or, or anything? I mean, I'm out at my house at 6 in the morning, and people are literally doing 50 down that road. I think, I think the best thing we're going to try to do, and I will make sure that this happens, that we will do traffic enforcement on our radar. And the speed bumps have a big success as far as actually being effective in traffic control, but nothing beats having a cop on the side of the road with lights flashing and bird gets out the best we can. During those hours, we discussed in the morning and afternoon. Try that for a while and then see if there's some other alternatives. I mean, I could just throw some two by fours out there. Well, don't, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. But I mean, people, people, I've talked to a lot of people in my neighborhood and they are just so fed up with it. I can understand. So, I mean, so, people like, might uh, show up with pitchforks, is all I'm saying. Yeah, contact, okay, cool. Yeah. And I, I'll make you bring your call here. We're in the middle of moving, so, but we have, we get a chance on the sign and we can check out the wood avenue. Oh, yeah, and okay. Diana had talked about the homeless man yeah. that had the Wendy's car. Yeah, we did. But that, that's that house on Wood Avenue. Okay. That's where they're piling up those Wood Dixie carts at. All right. All right. So. Thank you for bringing that for, for attention. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we have uh, Diana Aiden. <laughs> right behind you. They're on the water sprinklers on. Mm -hmm. Diana Aiden, 14 North St. Clair Aberts Avenue. Um, I just wanted to commend all the council members and the administrators for doing such a great job. Um, I know the budget is tough, and um, some of the items, I know you've got a rendering from Mr. Stevenson today, but I want to say thank you, anyway, for giving me the explanation about your kind of camping. Um, I do have to agree with uh, Shannon. Um, I live on St. Clair Abrams. When school is in, Try backing out of my driveway, and it's car after car after car after car. They get to that certain point there where the speed limit sign decreases for the school zone, and right after that, they are running it just to get to the light down here. Um, I know that because I'm trying to pull out and I kind of guesstimate the speed if I can make it out safely enough to get to work on time. Uh, we do have to do something. I came home early one day and I've got parents out there yelling and screaming at each other, honking the horns at each other because somebody is cutting in line over another and the line goes in front of my house. I can't even back out of my driveway um, because they are not adhering to the rules when they're backing up St. Clair Abrams Avenue. If we do a stop sign, I, something has to be done. I'll get for James. We'll look at it and mm -hmm. get a quick action on it. Okay. Great. Um, thanks again. Great job. And I'm looking forward to Christmas holidays. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Right. Anyone else like to be heard in the audience? Yes, please. It's a shame that Vice Mayor Fisher stepped away, but I, I kind of side with her regarding the Youth um, Council. When that program was put together was for to get that involvement of those kids in here and see what happens and how government works. And, and I understand the point that it is long hours. It's 7.15. You're all here. You would have probably rather been done by 5 o'clock and still go staff. But that's not the case. And if we don't start training the next generation on, you know, it's not cookie time. You go home. We need to stay here and do what we need to do and what we signed up for. When they go on football fields, it's hot out there. They're sweating and they have to do what they have to do. So I don't. I, I think it's a big cop out that we're we're letting them get away with. Oh, it's they can't be here for more than an hour. Or oh, it's Wednesday they got to go to church. Well, then they shouldn't sign up for it. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor Fisher, I'm discussing youth the youth council. I was really disappointed, and I agree with you on the way that's gone. Last year the presence here was minimal. One of my companies supports those jackets, and, and I'm sure we we'll want to do that again this year. But 
we'd like to see a little more out of that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience? All right. We're going to go on to reports. Mr. Drury, do you have anything there? Uh, nothing added other than the, the um, enforcement, other than this in many, many years. And uh, I think our police chief can develop a really good enforcement program. We have these issues arise all over the city uh, and they flare up uh, when uh, our police chief and his team get on it, they get on it. Uh, everywhere it's been uh, applied, uh, usually the issue starts to go away. So thank you for bringing it to our attention. Uh, I think we'll have some folks out there and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start dealing with it. Actually, I actually have a report. Um, for 25 years, the Tiberius Police Department has lived at 201 East Main Street. That will no longer be the case. This coming Monday at 8 a.m., the Tiberius Police Department will be operating out of 911 Gateway Drive <laughs> in Tiberius at the new building. And that the fire department will be following extremely soon thereafter. We have a couple things yet. But um, all of our operations will be up and running, will be fully functional. Even during the transition of the next several days, uh, we will be able to provide 100% service. We'll be just moving around a lot. Um, and the records department may be closed for a day while we do some moving of stuff. So 8 o'clock, 8 a.m., if you haven't come down to the station, come on down, take a look at it. It is, I have to say so, one of the most beautiful public safety buildings I've seen, and I've been in a lot of them. So, so I just want to report to that. So we won't be there anymore. We'll be over there. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. I just wanted to add that uh, in the absence of uh, Kirby Smith today, I would remind you to Call your mother or your father. Today is uh, National Senior Citizen Day. And if you have an elderly person in your life that you love and appreciate, today would be the day. In 1998, President Ronald Reagan uh, declared this uh, national holiday for senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Wednesday. Thank you. Mayor, yes, um, and I know it's late, just briefly, ditto what uh, Chief Lupin said. Um, before, this, before this board meets again, we will be working out of our new building. So thank you to the board, thank you to our previous boards who have made this dream possible. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. I just want to say, we're going to miss you guys. Very much so. Don't be a stranger.
um, y'all don't forget, you know, it's my favorite time of year, Little League. Mm -hmm. And it's the Little League World Series in my team's river, river Ranch, Louisiana. And they uh, are going into the final game to find out if they're going to make it to the World Series. But uh, y'all watch it. It's been on every night. And it'll be on Sunday. It's the big game. So uh, make plans. And I absolutely love it. You know, those little boys play their hearts out. So something to do. And what age is it that you're a senior citizen? I'm just wondering. When did you call yourself? But no, I'm wondering when is the, what they... I, I think it was 55. I mean, are, you, are you a senior citizen at 55? Stay at five. Oh, then that's not me. Okay. Yeah. I was going to give everybody my number, but I'm not old enough yet, so... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well. That's it. 62, I'm not 62. <laughs> yeah, I sort of, I... Uh, I was able to attend the uh, Fort Lee Cities Conference this past weekend. Um, great experience. Uh, got a lot of uh, networking opportunities. Uh, got to listen to some great speakers. Uh, some very interesting and informative classes they were able to attend. Uh, so it was uh, quite a success. And also, I just want to thank Mike for putting on the uh, Top Plan meeting tomorrow. I encourage everybody here. It's uh, very important if you're interested in the future of Tavares for the next uh, 20 years. I hope that uh, all of you can attend that. So, uh, so that's very important. So look forward to seeing everybody there tomorrow. And with no further business, this meeting is adjourned.